Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one problem that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too, that you've got Michael Jordan level talent at something. So today, let's get some ultimate motivation from one of the best, Dan Locke. Many years ago, I had this conversation with my mentor. And he asked me the question, Dan, what do you think is the number one quality of an entrepreneur? And I said many, many things. I said talent, and I said team, and I said good idea. I said many, many, many things, and no. He said, the number one quality of a successful entrepreneur is this, and that is the ability to endure pain for a long period of time. Didn't talk about the Ferrari, didn't talk about the big house, pain for a long period of time. Is that you? What are you willing to give up? What price are you willing to pay to accomplish success, to build your business? I could tell you any successful entrepreneurs that I know, almost all of them experience pain for a long period of time before they accomplish even just a little bit of success. I thought that happiness is a destination. That if I, I get to some place, I, I make certain amount of money, if I own certain amount of things, then I would be happy. Then I realized as I, I'm now older and a little bit more mature, a little bit wiser, that it's not, happiness is not something that you seek. It's something that's already within you but a lot of time we are blocking it. So you think about why people are depressed, why people are unhappy. Usually it's because when their expectation, because you have a certain expectation of how your life should look like, where, what, how, where you should be at this, by this point, and your reality. When your expectation and your reality, when they don't match up, you get depressed. You feel very, very unhappy because this is where you are, this is where you think you should be. And the bigger this gap, the more unhappy you are. So to be happier, you can do two things. You can either lower your expectation so that your gap is not as large. Example, you want to make a billion dollars and you're making now a thousand dollars a month. Well, you will feel very unhappy very, very much unhappy because you think this is where I should be and this is where I'm at. Well, if you low expectation, oh, you said a hundred bucks, you low expectation, I'm gonna make a hundred and two dollars, right? And now you're making a hundred. Okay, now you're not so bad. I think I'm only short two dollars, right? That's okay. So you can lower your expectation, which is what you can do. Or you can now change your reality, how you can shorten the gap, right? That's what an achiever does. How do you match? How do you push and challenge your reality to match to your expectation? You could do that. Or the other way that I look at it is this. When I start the day with attitude of gratitude, coming from a place of giving, coming from a place of love, coming from a place of I have enough, right? I have enough. Because whatever your goal is, you're getting the same thing, but just more, right? You have one car, you want two cars, you want three cars, but it's the same thing. If you're not grateful, you don't appreciate what you have now, you're not gonna appreciate what you'll get then. So I am grateful with what I have. I start with that while achieving what I want, right? I'm grateful with what I have while achieving what I want next. When I start from this place, I just find that I'm much happier. I like today, I'm a, I'm a happy guy, believe me. One of the things that holds people back that I believe is fear. Fear of failure. I want you to ask yourself this question. What would you do differently if you knew you couldn't fail? Would you take more risk? Would you be more aggressive? You don't need to be afraid of failure. I'll give you a perfect example. When I was making an offer, when I was driving people to take an action and investing in themselves, when I'm speaking to a, to a group of audience, maybe 100 people, 200 people, 500 people, on a good day, I might have 10, 15, 20% of the people in the audience, they will take action and they will invest in themselves. So you would say, wow, that's a 20% success rate. Yes, that is a 20% success rate. But the other way to look at this is basically I fail even 
on a good day, 80% of the time, I would get a rejection. 80% of the audience would say no. In marketing, when you are running traffic, when you're doing your marketing online, let's say you get a 3% conversion, meaning 100 people visit your website, 3% will take action. They say your conversion of 3%. 97% would say no, 97% would not buy, and 97% would not take action. Well, guess what? You have a 97% failure rate. You see, anyone who achieves any kind of success experience failure on a consistent basis. Whatever you're going through right now, I know may be very, very difficult. And it almost feels like the end of the world, and you're only the world, right? And you're only the world. I want you to imagine that you are now three years, five years, maybe even 10 years from today. And now you're looking back at what's happening right now. And you ask yourself some of these questions. Is this as bad as I thought it is? What can I learn from this? I know it's very difficult. You say, I not learn, learn nothing from it. There's nothing I'm learning from this. No, what are some lessons you could, you could take away? What's some of the value you can get from this, right? It's going to be the most difficult one. What could you be grateful for that this happened to you? And you're like, oh, come on. Come on, Dan, there's nothing to be grateful for. This accident happened, this emergency happened, or something tragic that just happened. Like, there's nothing that I could be grateful for. I know, but if there is something you could be grateful for, what could you be grateful for? Ask yourself those questions. Suddenly, that would give you perspective. And when you come back to reality, where you are now, you're looking at scenario, okay, if it's 10 years from now, maybe it's not as bad. Imagine even things that happened to you in the past, the adversities that you experienced in the past. Think about that. It could be two, three, five, 10 years ago. Back then, that felt like the end of the world. That felt like it's the worst thing that's ever happened to you back then. Now, looking today, looking back, back then, how do you feel about those incidents? My bet is this, it is not as bad as you thought and you learn a lot from it and probably you find something that you could be grateful for. That, that adversity turns out to be one of the greatest thing that's ever happened to you. Successful people have great habits. Unsuccessful people have lousy habits. Habits like smoking, drinking, taking drugs, watching too much TV. You see, successful people are where they are today because of their habits. Habits determine 95% of a person's behavior. Everything that you are today, everything that you will accomplish in the future is determined by the quality of the habits that you form. What I've found that is the very best people have the best habits. You see, successful people are simply those with successful habits. Successful habits could be getting up in the morning, meditate, reading, exercising regularly. How many of these habits do you have? I'm just an introvert, I'm not good with people, and I'm just like, mm, it's okay, I don't, I don't like to talk, I'll just be like that. Right, you use that as an excuse. You use that to stay in your own bubble. You use that to stay in your own shell. Guess what? Believe it or not, I was a very, very shy person. I was an introvert. I was the kid, when I was going through high school, I had no friends. I didn't want to talk to people because I couldn't speak the language. I was so afraid. Even now, sometimes when I go to meet a lot of people, I still sometimes have that little bit of awkwardness. It's normal but I don't let that hold me back. I know if I want to be more successful, if I want to be rich, I have to get outside of my comfort zone. I have to overcome my shyness. That's how I could do what I do. So don't use that, your personality, as an excuse to hold you back. To be a great leader, to inspire other people, here's what I believe in, that you must have something that is bigger than yourself in order to inspire people, in order to enroll people into your vision. Example, if you talk to your employee, you talk to your team member, and you say, hey, you know what? This is why we're doing this, so that I could make enough money so that I could retire, or so that I could build this business, so that I could be you know, living the, the 10 hour work week or 12 hour work week to be a lifestyle entrepreneur. See, that doesn't inspire anybody because it's all about me, 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 me. 
So to be a great leader, to inspire other people, you gotta have a vision that is so big, that's so compelling that other people want to be part of that, right? It's like, imagine you are the captain of this ship and you're saying, hey, this is where we're going. We're going to this island and it's going to be great. And we are going to, to have all these great things when we get there. And that's like, wow, you know, people look at that and say, yeah, I want to be part of that. But I, I want to, I want to join this journey. I want to, I want to join alongside and, and, and be alongside with you. And maybe there's some obstacles. There will always be challenges. There will be waves in the ocean, but that's okay. I want to join you and help you to, to fight along and be alongside with you going through this journey. So I believe very much that leader needs to think about what is your mission. Don't start a business if you don't understand the industry. I always ask this question before you start any business, and that is, and I'm asking you right now, why you and why now? If your answer is, oh, I just want to make some money, you're going to fail. Why you and why now? What qualifies you to be in this space right now? Not what you just saw on Facebook. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. This person, this guy is making so much money doing this, I should jump into that too. No, why you and why now? In order to make money in any industry, you have to understand the industry. If you don't know the industry, first you have to learn the industry. Let's say you wanna go open up a restaurant, and I'm not saying that's a good idea, but let's say you wanna open up a restaurant. Well, isn't it a good idea to just go work at a restaurant? See, what's the day-to-day -day operation like? What's it like to, to work in a restaurant before you open up a restaurant? So you have to know your industry. Things are fine, you know, I don't, I don't need to be that ambitious. Well, that's the problem. Your income zone is your comfort zone. Your comfort zone is your income zone. When you get complacent, when you get comfortable, you are not growing. Remember, when you're not growing, you are dying. So do you have this ego that is holding you back right now? And what are you gonna do about it? When did you realize in your platform closing career, your speaking career, like that's all I'm gonna focus on? Impact and serving. Well, there are two incidents that happened, mm -hmm. right? So first is when I hit 30 years old, that one day I got in the morning, I have tears coming down my cheek. Yes. And I was crying. I don't know why I was crying. I would just have this depression coming over me, which I, I, I don't get depressed. Right. It doesn't happen to me. And I realized I've, up to that point, the way I live my life, that I've grown a company and made a lot of money, mm -hmm. but I wasn't being who I wanted to be. Right, because I was 20 to 30 years old. Like the seafood that you see today, more more pearl. But you can see from time to time, I've, I have that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I was Get all that want. before. Yeah. I was all that, like that. Mm. Right. I was that and more. Okay. Wasn't treating very very people very nice. Okay. Uh, wasn't just arrogant, because I felt I'm so smart and I'm smart, mm -hmm. but I it's 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 a wrong attitude, right? Uh, so when I hit 30 years old, when that happens, depression, and that's when I realized, okay, I need to look for something else. So remember, like my both mom and dad, they're pearls, right? And mm -hmm. uh, my big dad, my mentor is like extreme Ruby, right? You, you guys know? Yes. 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 <laughs> Ruby, right? I am person. Yeah, so I, the first, so I thought that was the way you have to be to be successful. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any other role model. Right. I didn't have five father figure. So from there, I tried to be big Dan. Okay. Like do what he does yeah. and all that. And it wasn't, and I, I got to a certain point, but I wasn't happy. So that was first turning point. Right. Okay, so then I realized I went to deep dive in, in terms of spiritual work, in terms of even religious work. I did a lot of studying. And I found my kind of new path, right? So that's number one. Second is when my father passed away. Mm -hmm. right? When I chasing a deal. That yeah. was just chasing the next success. And I thought that would make him proud. Well, in fact, he passed away. I can like that. I miss, miss that chance. That's mm -hmm. when I realized that's not what life is about. Because when my father passed away, I'm like, okay, it's it's real. Like the people closest to you, they could they could leave. Uh, and then now I started asking, what's my legacy, right? What 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 do I want to be, right? Do I do I want to keep going? I can make a lot of money, which I'm very good at making money. No problem, mm -hmm. right? 
but then I would think about one thing that also when I went to the Bruce Lee um, uh, grave uh, in Seattle, right? The, mm -hmm. You know, I was there every five minutes. There's someone going there hmm. every five minutes after all these years. Every five minutes from nice. all kinds of background, from all kinds of country countries, people bring flowers and all that. I'm like, that's a legacy. Right, that's a legacy. He's an iconic martial arts actor that lives throughout this age, right? And I'm like, I'm not saying like I'm, I'm Bruce Lee anything. I'm just saying that, wow, right? So that inspires me. That's when I shift my focus into. Here's the number one success secret that no one talks about and no one shares. This is something I've learned from my mentor, Dan Pena, the $50 billion man. Self-esteem. It's the foundation of all success. Now, I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm not talking about pride. I'm not even talking about just confidence. I'm talking about self-esteem. Now, what is self-esteem? Self-esteem is something that your parents didn't give you. Think about when you're growing up, when you wanna do something, when you want to take some risk. What did your parents, what did your friends, what did they tell you? You're not trained for this. No one in our family is an entrepreneur or you don't have enough education, or you don't know the right people, just be content, right? Be happy with what you have. Or, hey, son, I want you to be successful, but not too successful. I want you to think about what is holding you back, the goals that you have that you want to achieve. Why don't you do what you know deep down that you are supposed to do? Why don't you take that risk? Why don't you start that business? What's stopping you? Because you lack self-esteem. Now the next question you might have, Sifu Dan, how do I build my self-esteem? Let me give you a perfect example. Let's say you have a friend of yours and he tells you all the time, hey man, let's, let's hang out. I say, okay, you know what, let's hang out. Let's go grab a drink. Let's go, you know, go for a hike. Every single time he says, okay, let's do something, he would cancel on you. And that happens again and again and again. So let me ask you a question. If that happens all the time, how would you feel about this friend, this person? Would you trust him or her? Not so much. The reason you don't have high self-esteem because you have a lousy track record. Meaning, how many times you promise yourself that you're gonna do something, but you don't. How many times you make promises to yourself and you don't deliver? You don't follow through on those promises. And guess what? When you do this enough, for enough times, for enough years, you have low self-esteem because you know, you know yourself. Well, yeah, I guess I wanna do that, but I'm not gonna follow through. I'm not gonna make it happen. And that's why your self-esteem is low. You don't even believe in yourself. Little things, big things, you make a promise to yourself and you deliver. Successful people are incredibly driven. How driven are you? Now I'm not talking about you being a nightmare to work with or, or bullying other people. I'm talking about you pushing yourself to get results. It's your personal drives that turns your ideas into actions, into results. It is your personal drive that keeps you going when things get tough. It is your personal drives that enables you to bounce back from disappointment, from setback. So how driven are you or are you lazy? Do you procrastinate? Do you put things off? You see, for the first five years of my career, I didn't take a single day off. I was working 10, 12, 14 hours every single day for five years straight. Why? Because I was driven. I was driven to provide for my family. I was driven to prove other people wrong. And today, I am driven by my mission. How driven are you? The fact I like martial art because it, it's it's not a physical sport. True, it, it's a mental sport. That's right. Right, yeah. because a lot of time, well, you can play uh, tennis or you can play golf, mm -hmm. you can play all that. It's nice. Yeah. But martial art is a sport where, let's say, I'm hitting a heavy bag. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't matter how good you get, mm -hmm. you're competing with yourself. Right? That's right. And it's all about eliminating eliminating your own uh, defect. Mm -hmm. That I could throw a punch. Mm -hmm. Well, I can throw a punch, but can I hit it with speed? Right? Can I hit it with power? That's can I right. hit all that I need to learn and mm -hmm. practice and do all that stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, I love that part of it, and it's a never-ending challenge. It's never good. 
It's never good enough. You find someone that can do it faster, bigger, like stronger. Right, for sure. So I love that. Aspect. There's always someone that's going to be better than you. And I can go super philosophical. Right. Where I can not have a physical, I can just go all philosophical with mm -hmm. it. And I can do that extreme. Mm -hmm. and I love that crazy deep dive of life and philosophy. Excellent. I love that aspect of it. Love it. You see, you can make money or you can make excuses, but you cannot do both. An excuse is nothing more than a well-planned lie. You see the excuses ego says, well, I, I can't afford it, I, I don't have money, right? Or, or, or that's too far, or, or that's too, too difficult, or too, I, I don't have enough experience. It's always I can't, I can't, I can't, or I don't know how. You see, you could have a million excuses why you cannot do something. You only need one damn good reason why you must do it. Back then when I was going to high school in Canada, in Vancouver, uh, I had no friends, right? Because I was very much uh, an introvert. I was very shy because I couldn't speak a language. When I first arrived to this country, I couldn't speak a word of English. So I was very afraid to talk to people. Of course, when you're afraid to talk to people, no one would listen. And I remember I would try to communicate very, very even simple language, simple words uh, with my classmates. And they were like, what? What are you saying? Pardon me? And I would have to repeat the, the same thing three, four, five times. And because they just won't listen. And eventually they pretty much just lose their patience. They're like, I, I don't, I, I can't understand you, man. I can't understand what you're talking about. So they don't want to talk to me because they feel it's, it's, it's very troublesome for them, right? So I know for a fact, when you see what I do when I'm now communicating with you, that I can speak, I can command an audience and our fans you know, from all over the world, that communication, this is a learnable skill. It is a what? It's a learnable skill. This is something that you could learn. I could go from someone who's a totally introvert, shy, no one would listen to me, to now that people would listen to what I have to say. The fake ego. Have you ever met someone that you don't know them, but the minute you meet with them, they just have this weird kind of vibe that you don't trust him or her, or they feel very fake, that you feel like, oh my God, they're just so fake, they're so superficial, that you don't make that connection, that they're not genuine. Or have you ever met someone that just the minute you meet with them, you make that instant connection, and then there's that trust, there's, there's that bond, that you feel this person is sincere. The fake ego. Maybe that's you. Maybe that you're very good at putting on this mask. You're very good that in one circumstance, you can be this person. In another scenario, you become a different person. And then here, you become another person. And before you know it, you've done it for so many years, you don't know who you are anymore. You don't know which one is the real you. Which one is the real you? You've lost yourself. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Be yourself. I would rather people hate me for who I am than love me for who I am not. So don't, don't use the fake ego. You don't need it to be successful. What I'm do doing right now, right, this path, is it gonna get me there, right? If you are working at a minimum wage job, and you say you wanna make six figure a year, you wanna make you know, a quarter million dollars a year, well, what are the chances of whatever you're doing right now that would get you there, right? And if not, doesn't matter what you do, it's just, that's the wrong path, because this path will never get you there. When you're watching someone's video, when you are following someone on social media, to me, that is learning, but that's not mentorship. Mentorship is much more intimate. It's much more special. It's not just watching someone passively. So to me, there are a lot of people that you could learn from, and I learned from a lot of people over the years. I mean, I, I read so many books and I attend so many workshops and, and every lunch and dinner and, and all these people that are business people that I interact with, I learn from them. I hear their stories, I hear their struggles, I hear about their best practices. However, when it comes to mentoring, 
And when it comes to having a mentor, I've only had really now up to this point in my life, three mentors in my life. First one, his name is Alan. Alan is my very first mentor. He taught me marketing and copywriting, right? If you've watched my video, you know that. Um, second, and it's been my mentor since I was 20, in my early 20s, gave me my opportunity, right, to, to, to work for him for one year for, for next to nothing, really is working for free. But I learned a tremendous amount from him. And he gave me the opportunity, he, he gave me the, a chance Right? He believed in me when no one believed in me. My second mentor, Dan Pena, the $50 billion man. Right, You might have seen him on, on YouTube. In fact, I'm going to visit him in, in Scotland uh, in, in a couple months. And he was here, if you, you saw my videos, my interview with him. So he's been my mentor for more than a decade now. That's my second mentor. And my third mentor, my new mentor, Mr. Dwayne, Dwayne Clark. Uh, and Dwayne is, a, a super, super successful man with, with great values. And so that's my third mentor. So really I learned from everybody, but when it comes to selecting that right mentor, I'm very, very selective. I want to pick someone that I could learn from for a long time. Because most people, when they pick someone, they see someone on YouTube, they see someone on social media, oh, I want to learn from that person. I want to learn from that pers person. I want to learn from that person. Well, the problem with that approach is, Think of it like martial art. Imagine you are learning, you're taking a, a lesson, a, you want to learn boxing this week. Next week, then you learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And then uh, the week after you learn Chinese Kung Fu. And, uh, and then the next month you learn something else. You never get good at it. You never, never get good at anything because you're jumping from one thing to another. See, when I was broke, I thought I know it all. I don't need to read books. I know what I'm doing. I was studying all these businesses and guess what? None of them worked. Because I thought I knew what I was talking about. Guess what? I didn't know shit. Okay, you don't know shit. See, the know-it-all, always thinking they know everything. Keep doing the same thing again and again and expect a different result. That's the very definition of insanity. When you are an entrepreneur, right? When you are running your own company, it is not something that you do, it's who you are. When it's who you are, this doesn't turn off. There's no such thing as, oh, well, you know, I don't want to work on weekends. I take the two week vacation. When you're entrepreneur, you're going all the time. Because as I always say, that's why I don't watch sports. I don't need to watch sports to get some chip thrill. Entrepreneurship, it is the most competitive sport in the world. Because when you watch any sport game, guess what? You're playing for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever how much amount of time. Well, with entrepreneur, 24 seven, someone somewhere is trying to kick your ass. Somewhere, someone somewhere, they're trying to steal your customers. They are trying to grab market share. It is 24 seven. So we have to be thinking about how can we be better? How can we uh, serve our customer better? How can we deliver more value? This is ongoing. There's no work-life balance or how to separate the two. I don't build my life around my business. I build my business around my lifestyle preference. So right now I'm going somewhere. I'm going, I'm going to do an interview. I'm filming, I'm creating content, I'm connecting with you. That's integration. When I'm traveling, I'm traveling for business. At the same time, I will be travel uh, for pleasure, take a few days off, it's integration. Versus, I work, I work, I work, I work. Oh my God, man, I can't take this no more. I need to escape from this, I need to avoid this, I need to go somewhere. And then from there, I need to totally unplug, so don't bother me for a week. Oh man, I'll take a vacation, I'm sitting on the beach doing nothing and then come back oh my god man you got kind of to dragging your feet now you got to get back to work it doesn't work that way so i would find a time in between how do i recharge my battery now in my case i like movies so i don't need to take you know two weeks off in order to recharge what i need is maybe jenny and i we go to watch a movie two hours i'm recharged a good night's sleep i'm recharged and I'm back in the game i still get like comments youtube like racist shit, right <laughs> I look like Sai. I look like Kim Jong Un. <laughs> oh God, I love one. Right? Wow. Well, I, every day, I get that. Shit. That's okay. That's okay. They're they're not who I want to impact. Right. I see. Remember, if you have a million people watching your mm -hmm. your content. 
ten percent don't like you, that's hundred thousand people. When I have ten million people watching my content, that's a million people not liking me. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of people. <laughs> it's quite a lot. Yes, yeah. a, a million people like and and because Sifu is so direct and blunt and provocative, right? Like it's right. Mm -hmm. So people hate me, really hate me. Like it's not like oh I kind of don't like this. I hate your god. Like are you die like it's like very like direct stuff right because it's too it irks them right mm -hmm. yeah but at the same time I keep watching my stuff it's hilarious how it works <laughs> I see. like i've haters everything like same hate comment you suck and, uh, watch all my video yeah. <laughs> like yeah, yes, i upload yes. 9 a.m you can see like negative comment right there same dude right fast. They're, like, fast. they're like thumbs down immediately <laughs> What is going on? <laughs> they don't watch my stuff, but they keep watching my stuff. You see, what holds a lot of people back is fear. Fear of success, fear of failure, fear of making a mistake. Think about it. Before you do something, you're saying to yourself, well, what if it doesn't work? Or, or what, if, what if I lose money? And what if, what if I make a mistake? Then what happens? What if I don't know what to do? What if I can't figure this out? Or what if, what if, what if, what if, what if it does work? You see, always remember, fear is an acronym. It stands for false evidence appearing real. It's nothing more than a made up story in your own mind. So do you have the fearful ego holding you back? Instead of thinking now we're, in, we're no longer in, in a job economy, we're in a skill economy, that you need to think much more like a, an independent person with skill set that you offer, it could be to companies or to different businesses or to the marketplace, instead of thinking, oh, a job we provide for you. You need that flexibility, right? Developing what I call that high income skill. And I have a number of videos on YouTube. You can search on YouTube, download high income skills, you'll find that. So don't think, oh, I'm seeing the job economy. That job economy, that credentials economy where a piece of paper, a piece of paper is not gonna protect you when there's an economic downturn. A piece of paper is not going to prevent you from being laid off. A piece of paper is not going to prevent that your industry turn upside down and, and then this massive change that's happening. It's not going to protect anybody. What no one can take away is your skill set. The value that you know you could provide to people, to the marketplace, to companies. No one can take that away from you. So focus on skill, not just a job. People ask me all the time, Dan, why do you talk about money all the time? You see, there's nothing wrong or evil about money. Money is neutral. Imagine if you enjoy talking about basketball, Raptors, NBA, Canadian team, right? If you enjoy playing basketball or watching basketball, would you be ashamed to talk about basketball with your friends, your buddies? No, you wouldn't. Then why would you be ashamed talking about money? You see, you have a story in your mind right now about health, about success, about life, and also about money. You have a story in your mind right now, and guess who created those stories? Could be your parents, could be your relatives, could be the people that you know, your love, your brothers and sisters, your cousins, it doesn't matter, but you picked up those stories from somewhere. Remember when you were a little kid, the horror story? The scary story, the spooky story, the, the boogeyman hiding in the closet. Someone planted those thoughts in your mind and someone planted those thoughts about money in your mind as well. That it's hard to get money, that rich people are bad, that you have to do something bad to, to make money and, and it's, it's one thing to make money and it's very difficult to keep money and if you make the money and now you lose it, then you look really, really stupid. It is simply not true. The people who are struggling with money, they're afraid to talk about money. And believe me, they do talk about money. The difference is they argue over money. Do your parents argue over money? Do you argue over money with your loved one, your spouse, your boyfriend and girlfriend? I remember one of the few times in my life that I saw my mom cried was because we ran out of money. So remember, money secret number one, money moves to those who are not afraid to talk about it. I'll try to do something. Well, I tried. See, when you use the word try, the minute you use that word, you are setting yourself up for failure. You're giving yourself a way out when something doesn't work out. Well, you know, I try, I try my best. Hey, I try to call you, man, right? I try, try, do this with me. 
I want you, if you're sitting down, if you're standing up, you're doing something, you're watching me right now, listen to me. I want you to try to walk a step forward. Try to walk a step, take a step. No, 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 I didn't say walk a step. I said try to walk a step towards me. Go ahead. No, I didn't say move a step. I said try. Try to move. No, I did not say move a step. I said try to move a step. You see, the state of trying doesn't exist. It is a made up bullshit story that we created in our own minds. The state of try, it doesn't exist. Either you do or you don't. There is no such thing. Either you move forward, you take a step forward, or you don't take a step forward. There is no try. Try means nothing. It means nothing happens. So eliminate that word from your vocabulary. One of the things I teach all my students who are learning closing from me, very simple, I teach them. A role player day keeps poverty away, right? Every single day you spend at least, invest at least one hour role playing and honing your skills. It's as that simple. It's an integration. It's not like, well, today I don't feel like I'm gonna role play or maybe I'll do it tomorrow and then you procrastinate and you don't do it for a week and then guilt kicks in and say, oh, I know I should have done that but I didn't do it. Now if I do it, it's kind of too late that I look stupid in front of other people. It's all this BS in your mind versus, hey, you know what? I'm gonna do an hour a day. An hour a day role play, period. That's it. There's no thinking. I don't want you to think about it. I don't want you to hesitate. I don't even want you to do it. just integrate it into your life. Every single day, I'm gonna do an hour role play, period, if you want to improve your closing skill. You see, it takes all the decisions making out of, out of your thought, all these BS in your, in your mind, take that away and just do that. You are walking down the street and suddenly you hear <laughs> and suddenly you see a red Ferrari <laughs> just drove by. What's the first thought that comes through your mind? Comment below. No filter, no edit, just comment below. What's the very first thought that comes to your mind? My guess is, chances are, he's an asshole. Who does he think he is? So cocky, so selfish, probably a greedy bastard. Actually, you know what? Probably it's not his money anyway, it's his daddy's money. Or if it's a lady, it's a woman, oh, that's a gold digger, right? All these negativities, guess what? That's you judging other people. My question to you is, how do you know? How do you know? It's all made up stories in your mind, right? And you say, oh, he's not that good. She's not that pretty. He's not that smart. You're judging other people. You're projecting your own insecurities, your own values onto other people. How do you know that man is not a hardworking man? How do you know he's not a good husband? How do you know he's not a family man? How do you know he's someone who's worked 20, 30 years to get to where he is at this point? How do you know? You judge, you come to your own conclusions before even talking to the person. You see how your mind works? How are you gonna be successful? How are you ever gonna become rich if that's the image that you have for people who are successful? You see this on social media very often. People talk about the morning ritual or waking up very, very early in the morning because all successful people, they all wake up in the morning. So do you actually need to wake up early, early in the morning to be successful? That's one of the problems with people don't know how to filter advice. Now, are there a lot of people who are successful who wake up in the morning? Absolutely. But are there also a lot of people who are successful who don't wake up in the morning? Absolutely, right? But it's this propaganda on social media that people focus so much on that. Success has to do with your habits, what you do on a consistent basis. And you have to know what time in the day that you're the most productive. For some people, it is early in the morning where there's no distraction. There's people are still sleeping and you go through the day, maybe you go work out, maybe you do meditation, then you plan the day, that's fine. For some people, they don't wake up early, they wake up whatever time and then they work late at night. They're more like a night owl. I'm more like a night owl. I find that I'm the most creative late at night when it's quiet, when there's no noise, right? When there's not a lot going on. I find that that's, those quiet times sometimes become my thinking time. So that's what works for me. I think you need to find what works for you. Doesn't matter 
whose advice you're getting from. It could be from me, it could be from anybody else, but you have to know yourself enough. If it doesn't work for you, if you get up in the morning, you're like, oh my God, I'm so tired. You're sleepy, you're exhausted. And for many, many days and Dutch, just like it screws up your biological clock, then it doesn't work for you. And that's kind of one thing that I gravitate towards Bruce Lee's martial art. As you follow my work, you know I'm a martial artist, that Bruce is always about you finding your own path. That's why he said his martial art style is not a style, it's a set of principles. You define what works for you. Absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is eventually on your own. When you are successful, you actually experience failure much faster, much, much more on a daily basis, but it doesn't matter because the ones that said yes, that's what builds your business. That's what helps you to achieve your goals. So from now on, I don't want you to think of the word failure. I want you, I want you to replace the word failure from, from your vocabulary, from your mind. Instead, use this word, feedback. It is feedback, not failure. It's simply feedback from your customers, from your prospects, from your clients, from the marketplace. Hey, maybe this offer is not what we want, or maybe the price point is not something that they are comfortable with, or maybe mm, the way that you articulate, you share your message, you communicate the value, it, it doesn't resonate with the, with the prospects of the marketplace. Every single action that you take, you're gonna get some, not failure, you're gonna get some feedback then you're gonna be able to pivot. You can make changes to your approach. You're gonna learn something from it. So next time, you're gonna do it just a little bit better. And knowing this, the more feedback that you get, the faster you get those feedbacks. We'll talk about fail forward, right? Fail fast. Forget fail fast, it's getting feedback fast. Knowing, hey, this is a waste of time, this doesn't work, no problem. Forget it, now let me try this. Uh, and more feedback. Maybe don't like the feedback, but that's okay. It doesn't work. I know I don't need to waste more time. And then boom, hey, the marketplace, my customers, they like this. Perfect, that's good. Now that's the feedback that you want. When you're going through the adversities, when you're going through all these things, not only put some distance, but another thing that you could do is talk to someone that has already gone through that. One of the things that I'm very fortunate because I have a lot of peers very successful mentors, um, people around me, that whatever adversity, even today, that I experience, bad shit that happens, right? Which I still do. That, ooh, maybe, like, it, it would feel, I would feel frustrated, I would feel like, mm, maybe I'm not so sure what to do. But I would talk to someone. They say, talk to my mentor. And he would laugh and say, yep, I experienced that 30 years ago, 35 years ago, and here's what you need to do. And they would share with me my perspective. Suddenly, I don't feel so bad, because what happens is when you experience any kind of problem, any kind of adversity, you think you're the only one in the world that's experiencing this. Not true. I could tell you from experience, a lot of people have experienced the same things. You're much luckier. At least you have a YouTube channel that you could come visit and see and get information and get insights. I didn't have any of that back then. Mark Cuban reads three hours a day. Bill Gates reads at least one hour per day. I go through two to three books per week for years now. I'm still constantly learning all the time. And I'm not just talking about reading a book. It could be listening to a podcast, talking to other successful people getting coaching from your mentors. But successful people, we're always learning and growing and we never stop. One time I was asking a very successful person out for lunch. He's been very successful for so many years. He's in the merger and acquisition space. He's had multiple successful exits, so multiple companies at a very young age. When we sat down and we're sitting across each other, and when we had that meal, the first thing that he did is he pulled out a journal and taking notes and started asking me questions, learning. I was the one who wanted to learn from him, but it turns out into a learning session that he's learning from me. I'll never forget that. Because you see, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. The less you know, the more you think you know. If you're down right now, if you're not where you want to be right now, if you're not successful right now, don't worry. 
because the signs of success are not obvious. What often looks like a failure on the surface is just a stepping stone towards success. So wherever you are in your journey, you need to realize your adversity is your greatest advantage. Your pain is your greatest tool. Because happiness does not change you, pain does. Comfort does not move you, adversity does. Realize that your toughest times will turn you into the toughest person. What doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Don't hide your pain. Don't run away from your struggles. Use it. Turn your pain into fuel. Turn your failures into motivation. And never, ever give up. The most dangerous word that you could use day to day is the word hope. Hope, this word keeps you poor. Think about it. When I talk to entrepreneur, when I ask them, so what exactly is your marketing strategy? They might say something like, well, Dan, my marketing strategy is I build my business through word of mouth, through referrals. And I always reply, you mean hope. You see, hope is not a strategy. Most people, they hope to grow their business. They hope to get referrals. They hope to generate more income. They hope to have more free time. They hope to start that business. They hope they'll get bank financing for the investments. They hope. Hope is not a strategy. You see, successful people, we don't use hope as a strategy because the minute you use the word hope, what you're saying is you have no power. You have no control over the outcome. Well, I hope it works. I hope this works out. Now, it's one thing to say, hey, I hope you like this video. That's okay. But whenever you say, I hope I, when you give away that responsibility, you also give away that power. You have no control, you have no choice. When you have no choice, when you have no control, when you have no power, when you cannot decide, you cannot take action and you cannot make that happen. I can't do it, right? I, I can't, I, I don't have time. Oh, I can't afford it. You see, the minute you use the word can't, your brain stops working, stops looking for solutions. The minute you use I can't, well, that's it, I, I can't do it. Right? It robs you of your potential. It robs you of the possibility. Instead, ask yourself, how can I? See, when people say to me, well, I, I, I can't start my business, or I can't develop that high income skill, or I can do that side hustle, or I can't whatever, I always tell them, does that mean that you don't want to do it, or does that mean you don't know how to do it? Because we all have the ability, we can all do something if we want to. Could you do it if you really, really, really want to? Of course you could. So the question is, is not, I can't, is either you don't want to and that's perfectly fine, then don't say I can't, just say I don't want to. When your friends ask you to go out, it's just, well, you know, I can't tonight. Don't say I can't, just say, you know what? I've got other commitments. I don't want to go. Just tell them I don't want to go. This is not something I want to do. Or maybe next time, right? Decide, commit. When you say, well, I, I, I can't, does that mean you don't know how to do it? Because you could go get the how-to. There's so much how-to on the internet. You could go find a way, you can, you can take a program, go to an event, learn from a mentor, do something. You have the ability. So replace that word can't with either how can I, or hey, you know what, I can do it. I can start that business. I can learn that skill. I can learn from a mentor, right? I can quit that job. I can go on that vacation. You have got so much more potential if you just believe in yourself. Let's take for example that you want to start a Shopify store. Yes, it kind of doesn't cost you a lot, but the inventory costs you money. So you invest the last few thousand dollars you have. You go all in into this particular venture. Hopefully that it will work. My question is, what if it doesn't work? What if the product doesn't sell? You put all your life savings, the little bit of money that you have into it, and then now, 
what? What do you do? Where do you go from here? You see, instead of doing that and, and putting all your eggs in one basket, the best thing you can do is start investing in yourself first. Invest in a skill set that you can deliver to the marketplace in exchange of money. This dramatically lowers your risk. And then when that is working, then you can start your business. Successful people embrace failures. Do you embrace failures or do you take failures personally? You see, successful people, they are ridiculously positive about their future. They always speak positively about their future, where things are going as if it's already happened. Even though there's no way that it could happen, they believe in themselves, right? They have positive expectations about their future. Walt Disney was fired by a news editor saying that he had no imagination and no creativity. Steven Spielberg was rejected three times by film school before getting his huge break. Colonel Sander, at the age of 56, got rejected a thousand times for his recipe before a restaurant picks it up. You will notice the most successful people in any field, they are usually the ones who have failed more than anybody else. You see the difference between a successful person and everyone else? It's not a lack of strength, it's not a lack of knowledge, it's a lack of will. Winston Churchill said it best, success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. You want to get more customers. We all want more customers so we can generate more revenue. Now, it depends on your business type. You might have a two-step process, meaning you may not get a customer directly. It may not be a direct sales scenario. It could be a two-step process where you actually generate a lead. Maybe you generate a lead online and then you convert that lead into a sale, right? It's a two-step process. So you have the lead generation process and then you have the conversion process. It doesn't matter, the bottom line is that's what you focus on. That's what most entrepreneurs focus on. How do I get more customers? The challenge is if you have been in business for any length of time, that the biggest payoff, sometimes the highest paid leverage points that you have within your business may not be getting more customers because it costs a lot of money to acquire customers nowadays, right? When you're running traffic, when you're doing any kind of advertising, it costs a lot of money to acquire that first initial customer. If you are a startup, yes, then focus on getting customers because you need customers to survive. But if you have been in business for a while, then I want you to consider some of the other ways to increase your revenue, to grow your business. Work for free, are you a idiot? Well, that's one way to handle it when someone asks you to work for free or can I pay you later when you get results for them. But you can do it better than that. You can deal with the objection with finesse. Keyword of the day, comment below. What's the word finesse? It's like Tai Chi. You want to redirect. Don't fight force with force, redirect. Now remember, I used to get this objection quite a bit when I was younger. When I was just starting out in my career, right? When I don't have a track record, then people would ask me, well, Dan, I would, I would pay you uh, later when I get results, or let's, let's try this out, or can you work for free? Like, what the f am I, like a volunteer, right? I'm a business person here. So what do you do when you get that kind of objection? So I'm gonna give you a couple ways to handle this, okay? If you enjoy this video, give me a thumbs up, remember. If you watch a lot of my other videos, I think you'll love this video as well. So, here we go. Number one, it's easier to handle that with some kind of a metaphor and some kind of a, a question, right? A series of questions and paint a picture in their mind. So, when they say, hey, so can you work for free? You might say something like, hey, Mr. Prospect, let me ask you a question here. Let's say you wanna buy a Porsche and you walk up to a Porsche dealership and you say, you know what, I want to take this Porsche here home and I'm going to drive, drive it for a month and just see how I like it, right? And then maybe come back and maybe I'll pay you. Now, if you are the, the car dealership, you're the owner of this car dealership, what are you going to say to a prospect like that? Well, I'm going to say, no, that's not how it works. Oh, no, you're, you're like a stupid idiot. Exactly. Right, so that's a very powerful way of using a metaphor to handle it. Another way that I've used a metaphor, this is kind of an interesting one, 
I will say, hey, Mr. Prospect, let me ask you a question. Have you ever eaten a restaurant before? Yeah, right? So can you walk up to the restaurant owner and say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have the meal here and after the meal, I'm gonna go home. I'm not gonna pay, I'm gonna go home and see how I do in the bathroom. Let's see how much, how I like it. What kind of bow out movement I have. And then when I come back, I'll see if I wanna pay. Is that how it works? No, that's not how it works at all, right? Like, so there are different ways you can handle it. In a, in, a, in a sarcastic, but also firm and respectful way, basically telling them indirectly that you value your time. You're telling your prospect that you value your skills and expertise, right? Now in the beginning, maybe you do have to do a little bit of work pro bono to get some experience. That's all what I'm talking about. Here, we're talking about closing and asking for money upfront, right? We're signing a deal, we're signing an agreement, and we're trying to close a deal right here or right now. If you want something done, you gotta do it yourself. Wow, they'll never do it as good as the way that I do it. Oh, I don't trust him, or I don't trust her. If you want something done, you gotta do it yourself. What you're really saying is, I don't trust other people. That is ego, that's a form of ego that holds you back because nothing great is accomplished just with one person. It requires other people, it requires teamwork. So the do-it-yourself ego, this is probably one of the most common egos that hold most people back, that hold most entrepreneurs back, that's holding them back from going to that next level because they are control freaks. They have this massive, massive do-it-yourself ego that's holding them back. My whole life, I've only had one job in my entire life, working at a supermarket for one year. One day I walk into the supermarket, my manager was yelling at me, calling me names, and I got so fed up with it. I said, hey, 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 you and I walked out. I went home and my mom saw me and she asked me, oh, how come you got off work early? What happened? I said, no, I quit. I don't want to work anymore. It is stupid. It's a waste of time. And my mom was so concerned and so worried. Back then I was making just minimum wage with that job. Now, do I recommend that you do this? You walk into your manager's office, your boss office and say, hey, I quit. I'm going to now start a business. I'm going to do something else. No, because I put my mom through hell. I put myself through hell. Looking back, would I have done that? I'm not so sure. Now I burned a ship, I got that. But what I realize is most people are not quite ready for that or they don't have that tenacity to make it happen just quite yet. So if you're thinking about quitting, if you don't like what you do, and you're frustrated with the people you work with or you don't like your job, you're not passionate about it, what you need to do is you need to have some kind of a skill set first. What I call high income skill. You need to have a high income skill that produces income for you before you quit. Wouldn't be a smart idea because when you quit today, let me ask you this, how are you gonna pay your bills? How are you gonna get income coming in? How do you know the new thing that you're doing is gonna work? How do you know? You don't know. So a much smarter way to approach this is to develop your skill first. So when you have a skill that you are selling, you're offering to the marketplace, and you're actually getting paid, you're making money. And I believe the best way to do this is when your high income skill makes you twice as much money compared to your current job that you have right now, that's when you can quit. Then you can do this full time. The biggest thing that holds most people back it's not the how to, it's not the know what, it's not don't know what to do, it's not the business idea, it's the fact that they cannot operate on their own, being able to self-motivate, at the same time not having to get permission from the people around them. That they wish, how come, don't you know I'm doing this for you? How come, my, how come you guys don't support me? How come my family don't support me? How come they don't understand? I don't get it. I want to make more money. I want to be more successful to better their lives. How come they don't understand? Guess what? Most of the time, they will never understand. You're expecting something that, that won't happen. That's what's holding you back. You're expecting them to give you permission. Yeah, go for it, they cheer you up. No. Now, the question is, why don't they support you? It's very simple. It's very, very simple. 
I go through this whole thing exactly in my own life. First of all, they don't understand because most of us, we grew up in the miseducational system where it's teaching you to behave a certain way. Go to school, get good grades, walk this path, get a degree, get a job, work till you're 65, marry, have kids, get a, get a big mortgage. That's your life. Anything that deviates from that, anything that's not the traditional path, that is stupid, that is dangerous, that is wrong. You shouldn't do that, you should do this. So the minute you want to walk a different path, your, the people around you, your loved ones, they feel like you're so weird. How come you can't do what everybody else? Just, just be normal, just settle. Just, just why, well, don't take risk. Play safe, get a safe, secure job. And the more you deviate from that traditional path, the more they feel like the bigger the distance between you and them, they're afraid to lose you. They're afraid that to lose you, they, they're afraid that you leave them behind. That's why you don't have the support. And all your buddies, all your friends, do you really think they want you to be mega successful, to, to live that dream life, to travel, live in that beautiful home, to drive that car that they could never afford? Do you really think they want you to be that successful while they're living paycheck to paycheck? Hell no. They might say, oh yeah, we cheer for you. We, good, congratulations, man, good for you. Deep down, enviness, jealousy, lower self, it's human nature. So what I'm saying is don't, don't even expect it. You're wasting your time. You do what you think is right. You do what you believe is right. You walk your own path. They might see it, they might not see it. I'm not expecting to see it. This is my life, it's not their life. I do what I know I need to do. I was 20 years old. I just started my own one-man cooperating agency. I was struggling to get clients. One day I was on the phone with a prospect and about five and 10 minutes into the conversation, he said, stop. I said, what? He said, stop. He said, five minutes into the conversation, you made multiple grammatical errors and you speak with an accent. I don't think I trust you to write my copy. And he said, I think you're full of shit. And he hung up. Now at the time I was already feeling very insecure about English as my second language. That's the first time in my life that I felt rejected. I felt embarrassed, humiliated. And I was so mad and so pissed off, first at the prospect. How dare he talks to me like that? Why does he have to attack me like that? What did I do? All I'm trying to do is to make a living and provide for my mom. Why does he call me names? Why does he personally attack me like that? And then I made a decision, the decision that would forever change my life. I said to myself, you know what? From now on, I don't want to feel that again. I'm gonna work on my English. I'm gonna work on myself. So that someday, one day, not only that I will be able to speak with clarity and conviction and confidence, someday as a Chinese, as an Asian, as an immigrant, someday I will have these guys pay to hear me talk. They will pay to hear me speak, hear what I have to say. And I did that. See how many times in your life, sometimes you feel rejected. That you feel people just, why do people reject you like this for no good reason whatsoever? Maybe it's a job interview. Maybe it's a business deal. Maybe it's in a relationship, your loved one, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, that they break up with you and you feel so rejected. One thing I've learned about rejection is, it all depends on perspective. Sometimes, let's say in business, in sales, in closing, you have to deal with a lot of rejections in order to be successful. You have to talk to a lot of strangers, a lot of people saying no to you if you want to make any significant amount of money. But you see, if you look at it that way, you will feel defeated you feel rejected. But if during any closing call, for example, if you look at that, there are three things you will get out of it. Number one, you will get a yes, which means you get a sale. That's good. Number two, you could get a no, which is perfectly fine. It simply means you don't have to waste more time with this prospect. Or number three, for sales that you don't close, you will get a lesson. You'll learn from it, you'll grow from it. I want you to think back all those moments 
in your life where you felt rejected. I want you to think back. Doesn't that shape who you are today? If you think about it, those moments, those incidents, those times where you felt so bad, but on those also some of the greatest times. Without that incident, I wouldn't be where I am today. There would be no Dan Lok. The other four words that are very, very dangerous, they'll ruin your life, is I can't afford it. How many said that to yourself? How many said that maybe just yesterday, maybe just today? Comment below. I can't afford it. Now this I learned from Kiyosaki. Again, nothing new. He talks about when people say, I can't afford it, Again, it shuts down your brain. This, there is no creativity required when you say, I can't afford it. You want something in your life, I can't afford it. I want to buy that car, I can't afford it. I want to support my, my parents, I can't afford it. I want to take that vacation, I can't afford it. I want to send my kids to college, I can't afford it. You see how it is? I can't afford a quarter, I can't afford it. It is an easy way out because you're just making an excuse. So I can't afford it. It requires no effort. That's a poor person's mentality. And you know there's poor people say that a lot, I can't afford it. What, you think money grows on trees? How many have heard that before? Comment below. Instead of saying I can't afford it, ask yourself a powerful question, and that is, how can I afford it? How can I afford it? The minute you ask that, it opens up a world of possibility. The minute you change your vocabulary, instead of a statement, a victim statement, I can't afford it. Huh, stop. How can I afford it? Maybe I can't afford it with my current job. Maybe I can't afford it with the way that I'm conducting business. But how can I afford it? What do I need to do? What, what knowledge do I need to acquire? Who do I have to be? What new skill sets I need to develop in order for me to afford this? Do you see how those questions are much more powerful, much more empowering? Wouldn't you say? So how can I afford it? When people come to me and say, hey, Dan, I want to make more money. I always say, here you go, here's a dime. You just made more money. You see the problem with an answer that is that big. It doesn't give you power. It doesn't give you clarity. So it's not just about, you know, I want to make more money. How much more money exactly do you want to make? And also, I always say it's not just how much money you make, it's how you make the money. What would you do for money? What would you not do for money? Where do you want to live? Do you like a big house? Do you want a townhouse? Do you want to live in a condo or do you want to live in a, a penthouse? You know, what kind of car do you drive? It's not good enough to just say, oh, I want to drive a Mercedes. Exactly what color? What model? What upgrades do you want? Let me give you a perfect example. I've had multiple opportunities come across my table where it would require me to go to Asia and do more business in Asia. Multi, multi, multi-million dollar opportunity. But in order to do that, it would require me to maybe stay here for six months in Canada and then go to Asia for six months. Or a lot of travel back and forth. And I asked myself, hmm, the money is good, but does it fit my lifestyle? Is this something that I want? And I said, no, that's not something that I want. I prefer to stay home. I don't want to travel as much. So there you go. What I will and what I won't do for money, right? Where do you want to travel? How often? What hotels you want to stay in? What kind of charities do you want to help? Who do you want to help? What kind of investments do you want to own? Do you like real estate? Do you like stocks? Do you like bonds, mutual funds? Whatever it is that you want to invest in, that's clarity. You cannot act and you cannot take action. You cannot improve your financial situation if you don't have clarity. Lack of clarity means lack of power. And power is the ability to take action. Extreme clarity leads to extreme results. Today I'm gonna to teach a concept called the third door. You see, in any situation, there's always someone or something. When you can meet that some person, it opens so many possibilities for you. I want you to imagine if you want to go to a nightclub, okay? You go to a nightclub, you could line up like everybody else, right? That's the first door. That you are lining up and hopefully you dress well. And if you're a lady, you can walk in easily, right? If you are a guy, you gotta wait, you gotta pay, you gotta, you gotta wait for the bouncer. If the bouncer likes you, then it lets you walk in. Or maybe you wait two, three hours. Or if you are like the VIP, that you spend the big bucks, right? 
where now you are you get you get a VIP table, you're spending big money, that's a second door. You, you could go in and you don't have to wait in line like everybody else, but you're spending a lot of money. Now the fourth door, the third door I'm talking about something different, where let's say you get to be friend with the DJ that you know is gonna play at that night. Or it's a very popular DJ, and you befriend with that DJ, let's say a couple of weeks in advance, and you get to know the DJ. Now that's the third door. You get in a club without paying all this extra money, without lining up, you can kind of skip the line. And then because you find that one person that can help you skip all the headaches, that can skip all the typical traditional way of approaching someone. So I want you to think about your business. When you don't have that resources, when you don't know somebody, don't let that stop you. What is, where's the third door? How can you find that person? If you get to meet that person, it'll open up the door of possibility for you. If you want to develop established relationship with, with powerful, successful people, here's what you do. Do not go up to them and pitch your stuff. Don't try to sell them your stuff. Okay, you have to understand when someone comes up to me and say, oh Dan, look at my product, look at my thing, da da da, can you promote it, da 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 da, you have to understand what it sounds to me. It's like, well, Dan, you don't know me, but can you endorse me to your most important clients and partners? <laughs> it's no different if I walk up to the street and I walk up to a beautiful woman and say, your place or mine? But somehow in business, it's okay. <laughs> so here's what you do. Here's what you do. Here's how you follow up. Here's how you do what? Let me give you a tip. Do not give them your business card. It is not their job to follow up with you. It is your job to follow up with them. They are already successful. They have what you want. Why the hell would they follow up with you? You think about it. So don't give them your business card. Here's what you do. Ask for their contact information. And once you have that, maybe a simple email. And then you follow up, and here are the two questions you ask. It's two simple questions. First question is, how can I learn more from you? Not to pitch your shit. How can I learn more from you? And second, here's my favorite. What is the most important project that you're working on that I or my network can add value to? I'll say it again. What is the most important project that I or my network can add value to? Don't go up to people and say, hey, would you like to buy my stuff? Would you like to do business with me? Write this down, needy is creepy. <laughs> okay, needy is creepy. I always say that your willpower is never as powerful as your environment. A lot of times, maybe you want to change, you want to make a new decision, you want to take the leap of faith, you want to do something new, but your environment is not supportive of that. The people around you, your family and friends, they are not supportive of your new goal, your new vision that you have for yourself. Or maybe in terms of your environment, where you live in, that is not supportive of where you want to go. So instead of trying to fight with that, I always say change the environment. Change your environment is much more powerful because your environment is more powerful than your, your willpower, your, your discipline. So what can you do to structure and create that environment so that it's easier for you to accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish? Most of us live up to other people's expectations. We don't want to disappoint other people. So let's use that. Don't just rely on your self-discipline. Let's say you have a goal, instead of just keeping that to yourself and say, I'm gonna work on that, I'm gonna work on that, and when I get there, then I'm gonna tell other people about it. No, do the opposite. Do what I do. Tell the whole world about it. Declare to the whole world, this is who I am, this is what I'm gonna do. This is who I want to be, these are my goals, and you tell the whole freaking world about it. The world will hold you accountable. Just like my YouTube channel. I declare in the beginning, I'm gonna hit 100,000 subscribers. We did that. I declare to the world, we're gonna hit a million subscribers. By the end of 2018, we did that. Now we declare to the world, we're gonna hit 10 million subs. Guess what, we're gonna do that. I don't hide to myself and say, oh, I'm just keeping it to myself. These are, this is my goal. No, I'm gonna tell the world. We're gonna do it. We're gonna, you and I, we're gonna do it together. It's the same thing. There's this village and the government wants to develop this 
village. So they sent some of the top agents to talk to the chief of this village. And these agents, they showed up to talk to the chief and say, hey, chief, we are planning to spend millions and millions of dollars building infrastructure, helping you to develop this village. And the chief is like, okay, so what are you planning to do? The agents are saying, you know what, chief, here's what we're gonna do. We are going to have some buses we're gonna send a lot of buses to your village. The chief is like, okay, so why do we need buses? Well, we're gonna have all these buses, we're gonna have you, we're gonna educate you, we're gonna bring your people, and then we're gonna bring them to a school. The chief is asking, well, why do we wanna go to school? The agents are saying, well, when you go to school, you're gonna study different subjects and topics and so that you could get a, a diploma or a degree. The chief is like, okay, so what happens after we get the degree and the diploma? Oh, then you'll be able to graduate. You're gonna be able to find a safe, secure job. And the chief is like, okay, so why do we want a safe, secure job? Oh, come on, chief. When you have that safe, secure job, then you're gonna be able to make some money. You make some money, then you're gonna, you can have kids, your people are gonna have kids, and then they're gonna get a house. So like, okay, so, and then the chief's like, okay, and then, and then what? Oh, then you get a house, and you put aside some, some money, and then you work many, many, many years until you're 65, and guess what, chief? Then you can retire. And the chief is like, okay, then what happens after retirement? What do you mean what happens after retirement? After retirement, you can do whatever you want. You can go fishing, you can spend time with your family, you can go hunting, you can do whatever you want. The chief looks at the agents and say, I'm doing that right now. I'm fishing and hunting and spending time with my family right now. Why did you go through all this process? The moral of the story is this, that sometimes we are chasing, we're so focusing on the goals and we sometimes forget why do we want those things in the first place. Here's what I believe. It's a very important lesson I want to share with you. It's not just how much money you make, it's how you make the money. Knowing that money is just a vehicle, it's a mean to an end. At the end of the day, what is it that you're after? Look at Richard Branson. Richard Branson gets a minimum of $100,000 to do a speech, to deliver a talk. Now, why do people pay Richard Branson $100,000 just to do a talk? Because he is a celebrity authority. Now, you may be thinking, no, but then he's a billionaire. Of course, he gets paid $100,000. That is not true because there are a lot of billionaires out there don't get paid $100,000 to do a speech. Richard Branson does because he is a celebrity authority. Look at Oprah. What business do you think she's in? Now you might be thinking, oh, she owns a TV network. We all know that. She's a TV personality. She owns the magazines. That's not true. Oprah is in the business of Oprah. Oprah is in the celebrity authority business. You look at most people, the biggest personal brands in the world, they are all in the celebrity authority business. You see most struggling entrepreneurs, they spend way too much time working on the what. How could I be a better coach? How could I be a better digital marketer? How could I be a better copywriter? Instead, what you need to work on is working on the who. Everybody's spending time working on the what, you are not spending enough time working on the who. Who you are, who you want to be known. Almost everyone spends way too much time working on the what and not enough time working on the who. Who you are. You see, at the highest income level, you don't get paid for what you do. You get paid for who you are. You want to get fit. You want to uh, be healthier. Where you want to lose weight. Now, what are some of the things you can do? You could go and buy one of those, you know, gadgets and then machines that you see on, on TV, right? And then you buy it and, and then you, that gets delivered to your home and you use it for a couple of days. And very quickly, they become what I call expensive dust collectors, right? Or expensive like clothes hanger. You know, one of those machines and running machines, right? You're sitting in your bedroom, sitting in your living room. Or you can say, oh, I'm gonna sign up for a gym membership. And you know how it works. You sign up for a gym membership, maybe you go a couple times and then you stop going and then, oh yeah, I'll go next week and I'll go next week, I'll go next week. No one is holding you accountable. You cannot even hold yourself accountable. And then guess what, but you sign a three year contract. You sign a two year contract, but you end up not using that gym membership. Now imagine a different scenario where, yes, you're gonna lose weight, 
but you're gonna hire some people. You're gonna surround yourself with people who hold you accountable, who keep you accountable. So let's say you hire a personal trainer and you know that personal trainer is costing you whatever, $30, $50, $80, whatever that it costs you. The personal trainer trains with you, comes up with a, a some kind of a, of a meal plan and, and, and some kind of exercise planned for you. Well, guess what? Chances of you doing what it takes, that probability goes up. Rich people, we value time more than we value money. Poor people, they value money more than they value time. And that's why if there's something you know, with my Bentley, an oil change, or I gotta go do something or fix the car, I'm not gonna do it because it's not worth my time. My time is much more valuable. I have other activities that I could do that could bring in more money. Now you may be saying that, well, easy for you to say, you're Dan Locke. You've got money, of course you could do that. That is not true. You might be thinking, because you are rich, that is not true. I got rich when I started valuing my time. Most people never get rich because they never value their time. Once I started learning and I started having more success and making a few dollars, I was, I was becoming more arrogant. I was becoming more, you know, that I felt I was invincible, that oh, now I'm so smart, look at, look at, look at me and, and have all this money coming in and, and I was way more successful than every, all the people around me, right? And I thought, you know what, my sh doesn't stink. I thought I, wa I was the man, right? And invest in a bunch of companies. Well, guess what? All, uh, 10 companies. All of them lost money, not one of them made money. And, and it wasn't so invincible anymore. And that got me into, into quite a bit of trouble. So that's what I would say. Don't, don't be arrogant, get out of your ego, be humble, stay humble, be open-minded. You can learn something from everybody. Thank me later. And clean the damn room. Look at Kim Kardashian. It shows you you don't need talents to make money. You just need to get it. Well, is she a great singer? Is she a great actress? What the f does she do? She gets attention. Yes, and people pay for their attention. Most businesses fail, write this down, because they are not getting enough attention in the marketplace. If you want to grow your revenue, you want to grow your brand, you want to grow your company, you must get attention. You must get attention. Attention is a new currency. Money follows attention. Think of whatever products and services in your marketplace, in your industry, that are there products and services that are maybe less quality than what you're offering, but they're selling more. How many have seen that before? Yes, why? Because they're committed, those companies, even though they have a less quality product and service, they're committed to getting attention. You gotta get it out there. You gotta push your name. Because there's so much noise. I hear people, oh, but Dan, I put on like a, one tweet, you know? <laughs> on one Facebook post. How come orders don't come rolling in? Because it's one post. <laughs> don't think in terms of one, not one tweet. 10 tweaks, 100 tweaks, 1,000 tweaks. I'm at the Tokyo Sky Tree. You see, one of the things that I love Japan about the Japanese culture is their dedication to mastery. See, the other day I was walking down the street in Japan and I saw this gentleman, probably 70, 80 years old, and he's running his restaurant, he's preparing the, the supplies and waking up early in the morning and just getting ready to do what he does. Probably he's been doing it for many, many decades, many, many years. Yeah, he has a smile on his face. You see, that is absolutely incredible. Because when you think about it, in the North America culture, you know what I'm talking about, that we are sometimes very impatient, that we want something immediately, that I think we don't dedicate enough time to mastery that we don't dedicate enough time to master something in our lives. And most people who struggle financially, you notice, 
they jump from one thing to another. They try a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, extremely distracted. And they don't focus on that one thing. So how do you master anything? How do you master a skill except dedication? You see, in Japan, it doesn't matter if they are making chopsticks. It doesn't matter, matter if they are running a restaurant. It doesn't matter if they're making noodles. It doesn't matter if they're making shoes. Chances are sometimes they've been doing that for generations. That their father did the same thing. And they're running a small business. And they don't look upon what they do as just, oh, it's a job that I'm doing. That, oh man, it's a J-O-B. No, it is their career. They take pride in what they do. Even making a little dessert, you can see the dedication, the effort, the thoughtfulness that go into it. I think that's something that I find it not just fascinating, but something very much I admire. It's something that I think we can all learn from. You have to understand that when it comes to mastery, you don't get it overnight. It takes time. You don't build this overnight. It takes years and years and years of dedication. That mastery, there's no shortcut. How can you be of service and give back to others? You see, success is not about what you get, it's about what you give. And I don't just mean giving stupidly, I mean giving strategically. Giving help, giving back to others who deserve your help. And not everyone deserves your help. But if you can find that brilliance, where it's something that you enjoy doing non-stop, it is what you are good at, what comes easy to you. At the same time, it is a service of others and that you can impact other people and give back to others then life is easy, life is good because you love doing it and naturally if you are good and you love doing it, naturally you will get good, right? And when you get good, you will be able to help more people. See, this is something I learned the hard way because for the first 10 years of my business career, let's say from my 20s to my 30 years old, when, when I'm just building my empire, I was all about me, 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 me. I know what that's like. It's all about, you know, how can I make the most amount of money, right? How, how can I grab all the chips on the table? There's no win-win, it's only win-lose. And I want to win and you're going to lose. And I did that. And I made quite a bit of money. But something was missing, something wasn't working until I learned that it's not life, it's not just about yourself. When you can integrate your strength, what you're good at, and you can impact other people, life becomes much more interesting. Not to mention, when you make it about others, guess what? Money comes to you so easily, so effortlessly. So in order to be successful, yes, hard work has its place. A lot of people work hard, but it's not enough. It's not just, it's part of the equation, but it's not the only factor. I believe to be successful in life or in business, you need to find what I call your brilliance. That's right, your brilliance. What comes easy for you, but it's hard for others? What comes easy for you? What are your strengths? What are you naturally good at? Not, not necessarily just physically, but it could be what skills do you have? What is easy for you? Because sometimes we take it for granted. What is easy for you may not be so easy for others. You see, sometimes people talk about the concept of you've got to work on your weaknesses. I don't believe in that. I believe if you work on your weaknesses at the end of your life, you will have, guess what, a lot of strong weaknesses. I believe in life it is about finding and identifying your strengths and put your effort to make your strengths stronger. Focus on a couple of things that you are good at and how can you make that stronger and offer that to the marketplace in exchange of money to render a service. That's what works. Think about desire versus skills. Desires versus skills. You might have the desire to be successful and that's cool. You have the desire, I am interested. I want to buy a new home. I want to pay off my debt. I want to help my mom. I want to buy that new car. But if you don't have the skill sets to back it up, that is nothing. You have a desire, but if you don't have the skills, you'll always be frustrated. It's perfectly fine, you can follow people on Instagram, you follow people on Facebook, and you look at their life, and that's all cool. You have the desire, but unless you have the skill sets, unless you back it up with your skills, it's not gonna work. 
So what skills I'm talking about? I'm talking about skills of marketing. I'm talking about skills of selling, skills of closing, skills of revenue generation, how to manage your time, skills of personal self-management, skills of time management. All these are skill sets that you must develop if you want to be wealthy. So you have a choice. You could have your desires and no skills and you'll be frustrated for the rest of your life. Or you have your desires and combined with skill sets, now you've got something. Now you can back it up. Now you can create the life that you want. How do you achieve work-life balance? How do I run a global organization, be able to travel, win with Japan for 20 days with Jenny, right? And also be able to create content and impact millions of people in the world while maintaining sanity. How do you do that? Well, the key question is not so much work-life balance, but work-life integration. I want you to think about back then when you were a little kid, the balance swing that you played. You have two kids, one on this side, one on this side, and they're playing this kind of seesaw, right? In order to have momentum, in order to have fun with the game, what do you have to do? It's always like this. Imagine the balance swing is perfectly balanced, perfectly steel. What would happen? The thing won't be moving. You won't be having any momentum. That is exactly like life. If you're perfectly balanced, you will have no momentum and you're not going anywhere. What you need to do is you know, think about what is important for me, what's my priority? Because you cannot achieve greatness. Remember, great success requires great effort. Anything that requires great effort, you cannot say, oh, I'm gonna have a perfect body, I'm gonna have a perfect family life, I'm gonna have a lot of free time, and I wanna build something great. It doesn't work that way. Something has to give, you have to sacrifice. There's a pay price to action. What are you willing to give up to get what you want? See, one of the key questions that I asked myself is, when I was getting started, what is the one goal that if I accomplish that, would get me everything else? would get me all the other goals. And I knew I had to focus on money first. Because when I get money out of the way, I can focus on what's important in my life. Now I'm not saying be a workaholic, and I'm not talking about money is everything. I'm talking about I need to sacrifice some of my other priorities. What is that one thing if I accomplish that, everything else would work. And I pick business. Because I knew when I get the money out of the way, when I made my FU money, everything would work much easier. Then you can have more balance. It's not so much balance. So even when I'm traveling, guess what? I'm making a video for you, right? With my team. It's not balance, it's work-life integration. How do you integrate what you do into your daily life? Now imagine you're a golfer. Someone asks you, how do you balance golf with your family life? You would say, well, what are you talking about? I'm a golfer. I play as much golf as possible and I have a lot of golf things in my life because I am a golfer. That's exactly what I'm talking about. When you are an entrepreneur, when you're a go-getter, when you are an influencer, that is work-life integration. What you do with your life and your work, they are very blurry. That line is very, very blurry. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. So forget this work-life balance bullshit. Focus on work-life integration. How do you integrate your life? How do you integrate with your work? How do you integrate all of that with what you do? That's the secret to having that work-life balance. And communication skills come in many forms. I'm talking about writing their email, or writing their social media post, or conducting their meeting, or speaking one-on-one, -on -one, speaking on the phone, talking with a prospect, or even speaking to large groups of people. All those falls under communication skills. One of the things that I did that changed my life early on in my career is I joined Toastmasters to hone and develop my public speaking skills. I was also learning from a mentor to develop my copywriting skill, which is communication in the written forms. How to use words in print to persuade influence somebody. So all successful people, they have this one thing in common, the ability to influence, persuade, inspire other people. Do you worry how people perceive you? You know you want to do something, but oh, what would people think of that? What would people think of my action? Even deep down you know that's the right thing to do, but you don't do it because you have other people's opinions, ego. You let other people's opinions stop you from doing what you know is the right thing. Those people, they could be your family. 
They could be your relatives. They could be your friends. They could be your high school buddies. It doesn't matter. It could be social media. You're uploading a video. You're posting on social media. You're making noise. You're getting attention. Suddenly, you get a few haters. Guess what? You stop. People who don't care about you. Haters and trolls will add no value in your life. And some keyboard warriors, some losers, post a comment and you're like, ooh, I guess that hurts my feeling. And you stop doing what it's right. You stop doing what is gonna make you successful. Stop. Stop worrying about other people's opinions. It's just their opinions. It doesn't matter. Critics, haters, haters gonna hate. It doesn't matter. You do what you know is right. One of the things that I do when it comes to bringing new people on board, and that could be an employee, could be a contractor, it could be a salesperson, it could be any of the roles that you might have. What I like to do is imagine that that person is a jockey. How do you know if the jockey will perform well in a race? What I do is I would always give them a lame horse first. That's right, a lame horse. I'll give you a perfect example. So one of the key team members that we have now, Blake, uh, who's my director, first he comes to the company, he wants to help me to boost my Instagram following. At the time I only had a few thousand followers on Instagram. So I wasn't paying a lot of attention to it. I'm like, I was a little bit skeptical. Would this work, would this not work? And Blake came up with this amazing proposal and plan. I said, okay, run with it. Now in the beginning, I didn't have, give him a lot of resources. I didn't give him any manpower. I said, do what you could. I gave him very, very little. He was asking me to even uh, get some new photos for Instagram. I said, no, take whatever I have, see what you can do. And he was able to do so much with so little people to grow the Instagram following as well as generate revenue for the company with very, very little resources. Now that's a lame horse, right? I gave a good jockey a lame horse. See how far he could go, right? And afterwards I say, okay, this is pretty good. Let me give you some more resources. My high school geography teacher told me, why can't you pay attention? Why are you so stupid? You'll never amount to anything in your life. I'm gonna fail you in this course my manager at my first job. You dirty rotten good for nothing. Why could you mop the f***ing floor? You'll be lucky you ever get a job at McDonald's. I don't have a Lamborghini. I'm not interested in a Lamborghini. My favorite, the A86. The A86 represents the classic underdog story who punches above its weight class and showing the world that you don't need an expensive car. You don't need a powerful car to win a race. The character, Takumi, beats every opponent that comes his way with precision, with skill, and the A86. My whole life, I have people telling me, well, Dan, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't immigrate to a foreign country and start all over again. You can't drop out of college and be a success. You can't start your own business, you have no business degree. You can't do copywriting. You flung English twice when you were in high school. You cannot start a business on the internet. No one makes money on the internet. You can't be a millionaire. You can't be a multi-millionaire. You can't become a best-selling author. No one would buy your book. Who do you think you are? You can't hit 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Nobody watches your video. You can't hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. You can't hit a million subscribers on YouTube. You can't build a global organization using social media. You see, in life, there will always be haters. There will always be doubters. There will always be non-believers. And then there will be you proving them wrong. If you're serving a local market, if you are making money and generate income from just working with and serving people in your city, expand that. So instead of focusing on local market, how can you take what you do and offer to a more global market? So when this economic downturn in your country, and I know I have fans in, you know, all over the world, in your country or in your city, you're not depending on it when you are serving people in so many different countries, right? Because usually when there's an economic downturn in this country, this is booming, right? If there's, there's a problem with this country, right? And this is booming. So instead of focusing on a local market, serve a global market. Have you had moments in your life when you feel like you just want to give up? That no one is coming to help you. No one is coming to rescue you. 
that you've tried everything you possibly could to solve the problem that's in front of you and just feel like quitting. I've had many, many of those moments in my life and in my career. As an entrepreneur, I faced various challenges, competitions, problems on a day-to-day basis. And there are many times in my life that I felt maybe I couldn't solve this problem, maybe I couldn't overcome this, maybe I should just quit. I'm not going to give you some rah-rah motivational talk and say, hey, just don't give up, just hang in there, just don't give up. What I am going to do is to share with you some of the things I've learned when I've gone through a lot of ups and downs in my business career to get to where I am today. That what do you do when you feel like you want to quit? When you feel like quitting, what do you do? You see, whatever that's in front of you, whatever obstacle that's in front of you right now, and you feel like you have done everything you possibly could, that yes, I have tried everything to overcome this. My question to you is, have you tried everything? Have you talked to enough people? Have you read all the books that you could on this topic? Have you seek mentorship? Have you seek help? Have you done everything you possibly could? Have you taken all the actions that you possibly could to overcome this? Have you? My guess is probably not. Because if you have, you would have already gotten the results. You see, it's never a matter of lack of resources. It's always a lack of resourcefulness that you're not created enough, that we are not created enough, that we don't think outside the box enough. And sometimes when you get so close, so close to your goal, a lot of us, we just give up, we quit. When we are this close to achieving that goal, you see, success is on the razor's edge of failure. When you think it couldn't get any worse, when you think it couldn't be worse than what you're going through right now, when you think it couldn't be any tougher, that's when breakthrough happens. Sometimes in life, you break down before you break through. Learning from your peers is sometimes you learn the wrong thing. They kind of, they tell you it is a mess. It is a disaster, right? It's just back and forth, back and forth, lip service. Think about anyone who is like an athletic. They want to be an athlete. They want to be a gymnast. They want to be a basketball player. They want to be a football player. You don't look at anybody, how many hours they train every day. You look at anyone who's like at the, forget even Olympic level, anyone who's like at the professional level, how many hours they have to swim every day. Look at Michael Phil, how many hours, years and years and years. And that's why they are the very best at what they do. There's no such, when you, there's no such thing. When you, just, when you put your energy in four, five, six things, something's got to give. Something's got to give. You can't. Versus if you focus on this, you will never get to this point when your energy is like, like that. You can it's only get to this point when it's like this. This is single focus. But when you focus on this, by the time they say you're 20 years old, you're living like this, you're making six figure a year, your friend is like, dude, it would take them, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, even 30 years. You might never even get to that point, ever, ever. Just think about that. So you wanna pay the price early or you wanna pay, pay the price late? Do you know how to close? Can you articulate the value of what you do to your potential clients? Do you know how to ask powerful questions that compel people to buy? Are you comfortable talking to strangers, presenting your ideas, demonstrating your product or service? Closing skill, I believe it's one of the most important, if not the most important skills you need to master if you want to be rich. When you're talking to customers, you're closing. When you're talking to vendors, trying to persuade them to give you better terms, guess what, you are closing. When you're talking to your employees, you are closing. I think there are many, many opportunities we can take advantage of, but I think in life there are only certain moments where you accomplish more in seven months than you've accomplished in the last seven years. It's a very different kind of opportunity, right? So when you have those opportunities, do you recognize I will be able to accomplish more 
in these seven months than what I've done in the last previous seven years. You gotta recognize, hey, this is one of those opportunities. I better not f this up. I better not let this slip through my finger, right? It's a very different thing. But people don't, they don't have the awareness to recognize this is what that is, right? How do you know? Like, like, do you just feel it or? You would feel it and you would know. It's very simple, you know, hey, you know what? If this is, just like the internet back then, yeah. if this is what I think it is, and this goes the way that I think it would go, holy sh like where would I be, right? That's all I could think about, right? The first mentor, if, if I could learn a skill, if I could, I wasn't even thinking about it, but if I could le learn the skill, high income skill of copywriting and that would take me at least off this treadmill because I was not making money, my business was losing money, I wasn't going anywhere, my mom wasn't paying my mom, like taking care of my mom, well then what I need to do. So if this works and I could have someone that I could go to, like I would take advantage of that and that's exactly what happens, right? Because I was making like next to no money to making 10K within one year. Like it doesn't take a rocket scientist, right? To figure that out. And then from there, because I'm in the industry, consulting and then speaking, it just branches out from there. And then when I took that skill, went on the internet, I'm like, wow, this is like, there's no competition. This is crazy that I'm able to get in this early, back in 2004, right? Like, wow, I wasn't even thinking about, there's no competition. No one is like marketing a ton online. And then I was selling like eBooks and stuff like that way before eBook was popular. Right, or selling it in a .exe file. Because that, back then you don't have PDF. You need to have a software in order to read the ebook. So like floppy disk? No, 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 but you need to download a software in order to, to read the ebook, okay, okay. right? And it's like this type of stuff. So that's what I mean. I don't think in life we get more than three. Like if you, you get this done, you accomplish this goal, it gets you everything else. What is this thing? You get this, you get everything else, right? You have be able to help your mom pay off the debt, buy the car, get the girlfriend, get everything else. If you get this done, everything gets done. Then why do I need to worry about this? I don't need to worry about this. I just need to worry about this. Then I get everything else. But what most people do, oh, maybe I did this, a little bit of this, maybe a little of this, a little bit of this, to try to catch everything. I'm like holding it with two hands. Like, I'm like, I, I'm so focused. And that's why my life, you see even today, like really, no joke, why I'm only good at a couple of things, maybe a handful of things, everything else, I'm like useless. You know, like the most basic thing in life, like cooking or, I don't know how to do it. Because I never spend a minute of my time on those things. I don't know how to turn on the laundry machine. I, I just don't know. I don't know how it works. Because I've never done it. All my focus is on this, nothing else. I block out everything else. And just this. All this day-to-day -day stuff, doesn't matter. Michael Gerber from Emith talks about this. Most people, they're actually not entrepreneurs. They are technicians suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure. Meaning that they are very good at the technical work, at the thing, but they don't understand how the business works. They do not know how to sell. See, the number one skill that you need as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, is the ability to close. If you don't close sales, you will not bring in revenue. And with no revenue, you don't have a business. And yet, most people, they get into business without developing that skill set. Most people don't know how to communicate. Fewer know how to sell, almost no one knows how to close. When you can close anyone at any time, it means that you have the ability to generate revenue at any moment. Then you can create revenue for your company. And that is the number one skill that you need to make sure that your business is successful. Successful people are confident in their abilities. You see the two biggest enemies to success. Number one, self-doubt. Number two, fear of the unknown. We struggle with self-doubt. We worry, are we ready for this? Are we good enough? Do we actually have what it takes to succeed? Confidence is nothing more than believing in yourself. And believing in yourself is nothing more than doing the things that you once didn't believe that you could do. You see, confidence comes from competence. It's easy to believe in yourself when everyone believes in you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about believing in yourself. 
when you're not ready. Believing in yourself when no one believes you. Believe in yourself when everyone doubts you that you cannot do it, that you cannot make it, that you don't have what it takes. That is when you need to develop that unshakable self-confidence, that believe that you can do it. And confidence is not the same as arrogance. You see, arrogance is thinking that you're above everybody else. Confidence is knowing that no one is above you. Do you feel confident enough in your own abilities that you can do what it takes? Are you willing to bet on yourself? Not just words, but action. How often you invest in yourself? Are you willing to put everything you have on the line for your goals and for your dreams? Do you bet on yourself or do you procrastinate? Do you hesitate? Are you a perfectionist? Do you suffer from paralysis analysis? Be very, very careful who you select as a partner. You cannot do a good deal with a bad partner. I've had a few, a few partnerships in my life, and the ones that are good, they are very, very, very good. We have a good relationship. We, we make a lot of money together. We, we create a lot of success together. But the handful that are bad, they hurt me tremendously. One, one bad partner that I, that I had actually had to, to a point where we were fighting. Uh, he stole my customers and I had to actually shut down the company and start a new one and clean up everything that I have, uh, set up a new entity, walk away with a lot of money just because of the bad partners um, that I had. So a good partner is great, but you cannot do a good deal with a bad partner. In fact, you can. I would rather do an, do an okay average deal, but with a great partner. Because with a great partner, we're resourceful, we, we collaborate, we, we mastermind, we work together, and that, I mean that, we can turn any bad deal in, into, into, a, into a good deal. The one word that holds you back from success is exactly that word, someday. You see, unsuccessful people, they say someday. Someday I will take that vacation. Someday I will pay off that debt. Someday I would quit my job. Someday I will start that business. Someday I will be able to provide for my family. It's always someday and someday. Think about in business, if you say to yourself, someday I will get that customer. Someday I will close that sale. How much money have you made? Zero, none. I want you to look at your calendar from Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I want you to look at your calendar. Where is someday? It doesn't exist. It is a made up thing that we do to procrastinate. There is no someday on your calendar. It doesn't exist. So unsuccessful people, they use someday. Successful people use today. Today is going to be the day. Today, I'm gonna to take action. Today, I'm gonna to make it happen. Today, I'm gonna to close that cell. Today is the day that I'm gonna make shit happen. I'm gonna get shit done. Write this down. Procrastination equals poverty. Procrastination equals poverty. You see, unsuccessful people, it's always, oh yeah, I'll do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it someday. Successful people we say today. You see, when you use the word someday, why is it so destructive? It's simply this. When you use the word someday, you might think it makes you look noble on the outside because you are putting off your dreams, your goals, right? You're making a excuse because simply saying, well, someday because I am not ready. So someday I will do that later and someday never comes. And you'll never be ready. You don't need to be ready to do something. You don't have to get it right, you just have to get it going. You do not have to get it right. You just need to get it going. It doesn't exist. It makes you look noble on the inside. When you think and you lie to yourself that it is the responsible thing to do, that I'm not ready, I don't wanna take any risk, I don't wanna take any chances, when it is the most selfish and irresponsible thing that you can do to yourself and to your family. It doesn't exist. Eliminate that word from your vocabulary. Either say, you know what, I'm gonna do it today or I'm not gonna do it. I remember the first five years when I was building my empire, building my business, the first five years I was working. 
I did not take a single day off for five years straight. I was working every single day, 12 to 14 hours. I remember there were nights where I actually literally worked to exhaustion and I fell asleep in front of my desk. That's the price that I pay. While all my friends, they were drinking, partying, watching sports game and, and, and chasing girls, I didn't do any of that. I was focused, I was obsessed because I was willing to pay for the price for success. I was committed to spend a few years doing whatever it takes, doing things that other people are not willing to do, making sacrifices that other people are not willing to make so that I could do what I want to do for the rest of my life. What about you? How bad do you want it? What's the price you are willing to pay? And one of the most common things I see that haters, critics are posting is, Dan Lok is a scam. He's a scam artist, he's a fraud. In order for me to quote unquote scam you, I will need something from you, which I don't. Please don't do me any favor. Don't buy my books, don't buy my course, don't, don't even watch my video. Don't, don't do me any favors. Do me a favor, don't watch my stuff. I don't need anything from you. I don't need a penny from you, ever. I don't even want you to, to buy anything, please. Let me know your name, I'll put you on the list. So to make sure my team knows, I won't, I don't, please do not spend a penny with me. I do not want anything from you. I have everything I need. I have everything I want. The reality is this, the biggest scam in human history is you've already been scammed. If you're over 25 years old, if you're honest, if you have nothing in your bank account, you have no money, you're not living your dreams, you got nothing to show for, you've already been scammed. You have nothing, zero. You've been scammed. You've been scammed by the school system. You've been scammed by the society. You've been scammed by the government. You've been scammed by the corporation. You have nothing. You've already been scammed. No one can take anything from you because you got nothing for them to take. You gotta think about it. You've been scammed by your preconceived ideas of how things should work, but not actually how it works. Wake up, look at the world as it is, not as how you think it should be. Whenever people want to make a change, they want to change their lives. They don't want to follow the traditional path. Go to school, get good grades, get a job. Work till you're 65. Hopefully with a little bit of luck, you can retire. Anyone, they who deviate from that path, they're crazy, they are stupid. Why are you doing that? It is risky. Anyone, anything, any course that teaches people how to do that, it's a scam. It has to be a scam. So when I charge a tiny little bit of money for what I teach, that's a scam. When in school system that you spend 10, 20, 30, 50, $100,000 or more to get a school education and you spend four years, you get into a student loan. If that's you, comment below, share your story. And somehow after you graduate, maybe you get a degree, maybe you get two degrees and you cannot even get a job. You cannot even survive. You cannot pay your bills. You're still hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. That's perfectly normal. That's the way to go. And still people are telling you, your parents are telling you, that's the way to go. Your friends are telling you, yep, just stay on the path. Are you f***ing stupid? Can't you see? It is not working. Master, don't dabble. Master, don't dabble. Master, don't dabble. A lot of entrepreneurs, they have this, what I call shiny object syndrome. Okay, it, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's social media, it, it's, it's Periscope, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's whatever flavor of the week or flavor of the month. They never take the time to master anything. Focus on one thing and build on the next. Master one, in my career, I focus on building one skill first and then build the next. First I focus on marketing, then I focus on internal marketing, then I focus on management leadership, then I focus on, on deal making, investing, but one thing at a time. So my approach is more like this. Most entrepreneurs approach is like this. You gotta build, build one thing, be successful, and then work on it. What do you do if you don't want to be an entrepreneur? Let me tell you about my friend Ron. Now I've known Ron for almost 10 years now. He is one of the highest paid photographer in my city. He takes a lot of different photos, one of the most expensive in my city. Now he doesn't have a business, he's simply a photographer. 
What Ron has is a high income skill. If you follow my work, you know I believe in the power of having the high income skill. And I define a high income skill as a skill that can make you a minimum $10,000 a month, 10K a month, $120,000 a year or more. So Ron has a high income skill, which is a high end photographer. Now he's a very frugal guy. Remember back then, he could have bought a, a place, a house in Burnaby. He's making very good money, but he bought a very modest home. Not for a lot of money. And him and his wife and two kids living there. And he, as he keeps making more and more money, he put aside and saved those money and put into real estate. He started off buying smaller property, fixing them, flipping them, selling them, eventually moving into duplex, bigger, bigger units. And today, after all these years, he owns over 200 units in Vancouver. Now, if you know Vancouver real estate, it is one of the most expensive in the world. So he owns apartment buildings, he owns uh, commercial properties, 200 doors, 200 units. He doesn't have a business. He is not a business owner. Over the years, he, all he has is he has developed his high income skills. He has maximized his high income skill and he takes that money and put it into high return investments. In this case, real estate. That's it. He's now worth tens of millions of dollars. It's basically retired, traveling with the wife and traveling to all kinds of countries just enjoying life. Because every month he's got rental income coming in, right? So I want you to think about, you don't need to be an entrepreneur to be successful financially. What you need to, absolutely that you need, it's high income skills. Number one, smart entrepreneurs, they never micromanage. Now I want you to imagine back then when you are starting your business. Now I remember when I was starting my first few businesses, I was a control freak, where I was the king of micromanagement. I wouldn't know all the details, because in the beginning of your career, your business career, you are doing everything. You are the one man, one woman show. You are selling, you are closing, you are doing the invoice, you are doing the marketing, you're meeting with people, you are doing the fulfillment, you are taking a phone call, you're dealing with the receipts, right? And you are trying to make sure everything don't fall apart. You're talking to everybody. And you have to micromanage because that's what you need to do. But after a certain point, that behaviors, even as you grow, stay. Because that's how you know, that's what it takes to grow a business. I gotta know everything, I gotta micromanage. But then what happens is as your revenue grows, you will hit a glass ceiling. And that behavior as a rugged individualist, as a control freak, does not serve you. If you wanna to go to the next level, you have to let go. Now you can no longer manage. In a small details kind of way, you cannot micromanage anymore. So smart entrepreneurs, you have to learn, and we know we are macro thinkers. What we need to do as a smart entrepreneur is, we need to figure out exactly where we are going. What's our vision? That's your job. You figure out the vision, number one, and number two, you now recruit and hire talents to help you that you know they have the capabilities and have the right attitudes, the right culture, to help you to execute that vision. That's number two. And number three, you as a leader, very important, allocate the resources, the capital to execute that vision, to help your team execute that vision. That is it. That is it. When you are micromanaging, you cannot do that because you're too close to your business. You gotta step back and think about the big picture. What is the vision? Who do I need to have on my team to execute this vision? And how do I allocate my resources that will help them prioritize, that will help my team to execute that vision? And that is it. So small entrepreneurs, we don't micromanage. You have to understand the world revolves around value. So if you understand the world revolves around value, the business of making money is nothing more than a value and value exchange. Once you realize that, that is how money works and that's how the game works. So what we do is we trade our time, if you're an employee, our products or services, our expertise as an entrepreneur, right? Our skills, we trade that 
in exchange that with other people for money. What it means is the more value that you could provide, the more money people are willing to trade you with it. It's that simple. So instead of just focusing on, I want to make more money, I want to make more money, being all desperate and all panicking, what you focus on is instead of becoming a person of success, become a person of value. If you want to make more money, the question you have to constantly ask yourself is, how could I be a person of value? How could I become more valuable? How do you become more valuable to the marketplace? Once you understand this, money is not an issue because the marketplace is always, always willing to pay good money for good value. And you notice people who don't make a lot of money, people who are struggling or people making minimum wage, they are easily replaceable. This is someone working at, at a restaurant, a waiter, waitress. Maybe they, good, they do a very good job, they work very hard, but if they leave or the boss, the manager fires them, they could be easily replaced. When you could be easily replaced, you are not very valuable. The more difficult you are to replace, the more valuable you are. That's the secret that will guarantee if you'll be broke or you'll be rich. What do you do when others don't support you in your life? It reminds me of the story, this, this fisherman, and he goes out there to the sea and he would catch these buckets of crab. And one man walks by and sees that he's got this bucket, right? And there's no lid. And the, the man is asking this fisherman, well, if when you catch different crabs, aren't you afraid that why don't you have a lid? Aren't the crabs gonna crawl out? And the fisherman is like, yeah, if I have one crab, that one crab will crawl out. However, if I have a bunch of crabs, no, I don't need to worry about it because they will make sure that, that any single crab tries to crawl out, the other crabs will pull that crab right back down with, with where they are inside the bucket. That's the, the theory, the, 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 the story of the buckets of crap. Guess what? You have a lot of crap people in your life. They try to pull you down. They try to drag you down. They try to keep you where you are today. They don't want you to get out of that bucket. Now, why is that? You have to understand, if you are seeking validation, you're seeking approval, you are waiting for someone else's permission where, yeah, you know, it would be nice. I want to accomplish all these great things. I want to do these things and I, I want to, you know, create all these things. I want to achieve all these goals. But, oh, but the people around me, they just, they don't support me. So, f what? Don't expect them to support you. That's not their job to support you. If you need the emotional support to do what you do, you don't have what it takes. You see, you don't have to be the marketing genius. Your customer is the marketing genius. They will tell you what they want. They will tell you what they like. And they would also tell you what they don't like and what are they willing to pay for. They vote with their wallets. And that's the best bet. You see, most entrepreneurs, they spend so much time working on the thing or making their thing better, but they don't spend enough time listening to the customers. Is this even what they want? Did they tell you that that's what they want? Are they, are they giving you feedback? Or are you building something that nobody wants? And that's how most entrepreneurs fail. Now you might say, well, Dan, what about Henry Ford? When he invented the car, Ford Motors, right? What about back then? You know, he said, if I was to ask what my customers want, then everyone would say faster horses. Well, that's exception. If you are selling and you're offering some kind of disruption technology, that's a different story. Because then you're anticipating the needs of the marketplace and you are essentially creating your own market. I'm not talking about that. That's a very small percentage of the entrepreneurs. For most entrepreneurs, we are more tapping into the existing needs, the existing desires that people already have. And we're tapping into that. That's how we make most of our money. So smart entrepreneurs, we never stop listening paying attention to what our ideal customers want and what they need. Let's say this year, and you say, you know what, Dan, I have a certain financial goal, an income goal. Maybe you wanna make $50,000, $100,000 a year, $200,000 a year, half a million dollars a year, or you know what, you say, this is the year, I'm going to make a million dollars a year. Whatever your goal is, let's take simple math. 
a hundred thousand dollars a year. Let's say, let's make it even simple. 120K, let's take 10K a month. $10,000 a month, that's your goal. So don't use the new year resolutions concept. Here's the concept I talked about in my book, F You Money. You can go get the book from Amazon, but I'm gonna teach this to you right now. And that's the concept of D-I-G. D-I-G, it stands for Daily Income Goal. Daily Income Goal. So let's say you take 10,000 a month, and you break it down, you divide it by 30 days. Each day you gotta make about 340 some odd dollars. Let's just round it up, 350 bucks. That's your DIG, daily income goal. 350 dollars that you need to make every single day if you wanna hit $10,000 a month. Now I want you to think about this. When you get up in the morning, the first thing that comes to your mind, the first question you have to ask yourself is, what am I doing today that will make me $350 today. What do I need to do? What do I need to focus on? What, what are my objectives? Am I hitting my daily income goal? What does massive action look like? What would Dan Lok do? Ask yourself those questions. Guess what, if you're not hitting your daily income goal, you are not hitting your weekly income goal. You're not hitting your weekly income goal, you're not hitting your monthly income goal. If you're not hitting your monthly income goal, you're not hitting your yearly income goal. You don't need to wait till December and you look at a calendar and say, oh, you know what, I screwed up. I am way behind. I'm nowhere near making $100,000. What is going on? I know exactly what's going on. You're not hitting your daily income goal. You can look at your progress every single day. What am I doing today to hit my daily income goal? Oh, well, I kinda, I'm not doing anything today. Well, then don't blame and don't bitch when you're not hitting your goal. Oh, well, you know what, today I'm, I'm excited, I'm fired up, I have hit my income goal. You know what, not just that I exceeded my daily income goal. Instead of 350 bucks a day, I hit 500 bucks a day. Good for you, good job. That means you have that 150 bucks buffer extra. That's good, doesn't mean tomorrow you're like all slack off and slow down. It means, okay, I've exceeded that today. Because there are some days, maybe you hit it, there's some days you don't. You gotta average it out. Tomorrow, you get back into it, wake up in the morning, what am I doing today? What am I gonna do today to hit that 350 bucks? And what do I need to do every single day to accomplish my daily income goal? The concept of D. I G. Isn't it much more powerful than some New Year resolutions? Whatever your mind can conceive, you can achieve. But sometimes, what if you don't have that belief yet? What if you're just getting started? What if you haven't built up that confidence? I remember years ago when I was just getting started and I was already running my own one-man advertising agency and one time I was having lunch with my mentor, Alan. And after lunch, I was driving back to his place. And in the car, I was asking him a question. Now, at the time, my English name was actually Daniel. Daniel, so it's Daniel Locke. So I was asking him, Alan, I'm thinking of changing my name. And he said, well, what do you want to change it to? And I said, you know, my name right now is like Daniel and it's okay, but it feels a little, I don't know, I feel a little young. I want a name that has just a little bit more punch and maybe sounds a bit more mature. He said, okay, so what are you thinking? I said, I'm thinking of shortening the name to just Dan. And he paused, I said, okay. So Dan, like Dan Locke. I said, that's right, Dan Locke. I think it's kind of punchy, it's got that oomph to it. And he was sitting in the passenger seat and he did this motion, he said, Dan Locke. He said, I could, I could see that. I said, what could you see? He said, I could see, see Dan Locke live. Big banner in a big conference. I said, what? I said, that's right. That will look good. It's got, it's got impact. It's impactful. And I'm like, I don't see that. I'm just simply kind of changed my name to be a little bit more memorable. How could you see like, see Dan Locke live? This is way before I was even doing any kind of public speaking. I was just very much like an introvert and writing copy, right? You're hiding behind my computer. See Dan Locke live, a big conference, what do you mean? See, he saw something in me that I didn't see. 
He believed in me. My mentor believed in me more than I believed in myself. I didn't see the possibility. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't even see that. But he saw it. So sometimes in life, maybe you don't have that belief in yourself. That's okay. I didn't have that belief in myself. But don't underestimate when you have someone believe in you more than you believe in yourself. I tell my students all the time. I said, I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. And if you don't believe in yourself yet, that's okay. Borrow my certainty, so you can go on and develop your own belief. And someday, maybe, maybe you can use that belief to achieve what you want. Having a mentor, a mentor, standing on the shoulders of giants, learning from someone who's been there and done that, is extremely critical. Why we invent the wheels? Why not borrow someone else's wagons instead, right? Whatever that you want to do, someone else has already done it. You don't have to start at the very bottom. You can start at where your mentor is gone and start right at that level and then go from there. Isn't that a much smarter way to learn instead of going through the school of hard knocks? You don't have to get it right, you just have to get it going. You don't have to get it right, you just have to get it going. Most entrepreneurs, here's what they do. They mentally masturbate too much. <laughs> e, ooh, uh, I don't know, let me think about it. Oh, I'll get back to you, let me talk. <laughs> no. Perfection is the enemy of progress. So you know what, you wrote an article you don't like, who cares? Upload it. You, 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 up, you create a video that you don't like, who cares? Upload it. You wrote, you, you wrote a blog post that you don't like, who cares? Tweak the crap out of it. <laughs> There's a great quote that I love from Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. He said, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of a product, you've launched too late. If you're not embarrassed by the first version of, pro version of your product, you've launched too late. Don't follow your passion. You heard me right. I said, do not, don't follow your passion. I say that one more time. Don't follow your passion. Now, what am I talking about? You hear this all the time. People talk about, you gotta find your passion. Do you want your love? It's a very North American thing. Let me talk to you about the Asian culture. We don't talk about growing up, the concept. We don't talk about, oh, you gotta find your passion. You gotta, you gotta find what you love. No. In the Asian culture, first you focus on making a living. You do not have the right to talk about passion before you make a living. Now it's a very different philosophy. I'm not saying one is good or one is bad or they're just different. If you think about it, if you cannot pay your bills, if you're not providing for your family, you're not being the husband, you're not being the wife that are supporting your kids, that can, they're sending them through schools, they're supporting your parents, then you have not earned the right to follow your passion. When I was getting started, let me tell you this. The first few years of my career, I was working my ass off. I was in front of my computer 12, 14 hours a day. I was calling, I was working hard. There was no passion. There's not one bit of that that I like. You think I want to be in front of my computer, studying, learning, growing, doing stuff, getting called, getting rejected, meeting with people, doing all the hard work? I don't like one minute of that, but that's what it takes. It's not about following your passion. Following your passion does not mean you're gonna have a successful life. Because chances are, when you follow your passion, you do what is comfortable for you. Oh, I guess it's what I like to do. I'll, I'll, I'll do that, it's, it's easy for me to do. That's not how you think success. Now, if you don't want success, then you don't have to watch this video. You can watch, you can watch some other videos. Go watch some prank video or something like that. You don't have to watch my video. I'm talking if you want success. If you truly want success, you have to do, not just do what you love, you gotta do what it takes. You gotta sacrifice. Once I made enough money, once I'm successful, then I can delegate the stuff that I don't like to do. I can delegate stuff that I'm not very good at. Now I can focus on my zone of genius. Now I have earned the right to follow more of my passion. What do I like to do, such as teaching? I could do that, but in the beginning, for you young guys out there, you haven't earned the right to follow shit. 
You need to pay the bills. You need to make a living. Do that first. I remember when I was just getting started, my first identity was I was basically a wannabe entrepreneur. Not a real entrepreneur, a f***ing wannabe entrepreneur. I thought I was an entrepreneur. I was trying different things and I was starting all these businesses. None of them worked. I was losing a lot of money. Then I reinvent myself to be a copywriter, right? I developed that skill, I developed that high income skill as, the, as a young guy, 20 someone years old. And then I developed my next skill, which is being a consultant for all the clients I was writing sales copy for. And I was making very good money. As a young guy, 20 somewhat years old, I was bringing in you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars a year. That's, that's very, very good money. And most people would stay at that pace, stay in that same spot for a long time, but I didn't. I knew that in order to go to the next level, I had to reinvent myself. And what does it mean to even reinvent yourself? I'll tell you exactly what it means. It means that you have to let go of what what has gotten you up to this point and let go and go to that next level. That is a difficult part. It's one thing to let go of things that didn't work for you, but it's a whole other thing to let go of things that worked for you. So what got you here won't get you there. So I was making good money, I had all these clients, and one day I made the decision, I didn't want to do that anymore. I had to transition from being just a copywriter or a, a marketing consultant to being an internet entrepreneur. I needed to make a shift in my identity. And I called all my clients one day and I fired all my clients overnight without knowing what the next step is gonna look like. But I knew deep down that I knew that's the right thing to do. How many of you ever had an opportunity that you, it, it requires you to take some form of action to take that leap of faith, but deep down you know that it's scary as f but it's the right thing to do. And I did that. And I filed my clients and I started and pursue my full-time career as an internet entrepreneur. The one key, the one key that unlocks wealth in business is distribution. Distribution is what unlocks wealth in business. In fact, Ask yourself this question. If you're in business yourself right now, you are selling a product, you're selling a service, you're selling online, offline, it doesn't matter. Think about your bottleneck. What is stopping you from going to the next level? My guess is, chances are, it's distribution. It means that you're not getting enough exposure and attention in the marketplace right now. And attention, the right type of attention, is the new currency. If you're not getting attention, you're not attracting customers and buyers to your business. Now, think about even for a franchise. Let's say a franchise network like McDonald's, or it could be even like a Starbucks. What is it? They have many, 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 many locations, but really it is a distribution network. It is a distribution channel for them to sell more coffee or more products or more fries or more burgers in all these different locations. That's what that is. Distribution unlocks wealth in business. Whenever someone's on YouTube making a video, when I'm giving you advice, I am talking to you, but I'm also talking to millions of people. Because of that, that advice cannot be so custom tailored. When I'm talking to a millennial who is still in school trying to figure life out, or versus I'm talking to a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, the advice I would give them is very, very different. So one size doesn't fit for all. So you have to learn when you're watching anyone, including me, you're learning from anybody, you need to learn to filter. Does it make sense for me? How do I take direct action? How does this apply to me? Don't take anybody anybody's advice as so literally. You need to learn to think for yourself, to think independently. And hey, you know what, does that make sense? How would that work in my situation? You see, the biggest problem is, there is no excuse. There is no excuse to be dumb, for you to be dumb. With so much information out there that you could find out things. You go to Google. You know, back then when I had to learn something, when I had no money, I had to go to the library. I had a library card. I would go to the library and I would borrow a whole bunch of books. And every single week I would go back to the same library and I would borrow different books. That's how I learned, because I was hungry 
for information. I was hungry for experience. I was hungry for knowledge. And now with you, you can just go on YouTube. You can go to Google. You can just type. And you have access to so much powerful knowledge and information. There's no excuse to be dumb. There's no excuse not to know something. You don't have to like it, but you cannot not know it. Being, like, being dumb is just bad. Being dumb and broke, that's like really bad. I still remember when I was struggling financially and I was jumping from one thing to another, going from one idea to another, going from one business to another, looking for that perfect business, looking for that perfect opportunity, looking for everything external except looking within what am I missing and that's how I had all those business failures and I had 13 business failures before I found my first success and the problem was because I was chasing all these things and I was doing a little bit of this and doing a little bit of that and I was dabbling you notice when you dabble you never achieve mastery and you never achieve greatness you look at in any industry in any endeavor it could be entertainment it could be sports even think back Michael Jordan when he was the greatest basketball players of all time. And then when he went into baseball, remember that? Comment below. What happened, right? Didn't do so well. Went back to basketball and kicked ass, right? Championships. So if you think about people who try to do a lot of different things, they don't do that well. What you need to do is you need to understand that you only have a limited amount of time, energy, and resources. And especially in the beginning, you want to focus and narrow that down. It's like a laser beam focus, right? It's like, you imagine like, just like the sun, remember? You have that magnetic glass, right? You have channel all your energy through one focal point. And when you can do that, yes, that would create results. But the problem is when you dabble a little bit, a little bit of that, try a little bit of this, try a little bit of that, you never develop skill sets. Any good skill, it takes years. To develop not weeks not days not months so you have to ask yourself how much time am i devoting to this one thing and be world class at it i believe the easiest way to influ influence somebody not to convince them not try to test their arm but the easiest way to influence somebody to persuade somebody is by asking them questions by asking them questions. So when you know that the idea is wrong, instead of telling people, hey, you're wrong, this is no good. No one likes to hear that they are wrong. Even though they are wrong, they don't want to hear that shit. It's much better to ask them question. Hey, you know what? Yeah, it's okay, we can go with this plan, but have you ever thought about this? What are the consequences if this doesn't work out? Wouldn't it be a good idea to have a plan B, right? And yes, this maybe is going to work, but what's the downside of this, right? And can we live with the downside? When you throw it out there and you make it their idea, because one thing I've learned in persuasion is this, when you say something, it means one thing. When they say something, it means everything. So instead of you saying it, make them say it. Make them think about it. Make them question it. Make them doubt their own ideas versus you try to doubt their ideas. And also when you are communicating, when you're asking questions, you need to ask with certainty. In this world, in this uncertain world, what we do is we sell certainty in an uncertain world. That's what we do as closers, as entrepreneurs, right? As influencers. People will love you, people will hate you, and none of it has anything to do with you. You see, haters hate for three reasons. Number one, they see you as a threat. They're your competition. They try to put you down for their own personal gain. Or they're what I call parasites. Exactly what it sounds like, they're parasites. I have people, same thing, use my name. Set a fake Facebook account, fake social media account, pretending to be me, promoting whatever product and service, whatever bullshit they've got. It's normal. Number two, they hate themselves. See, haters don't hate you. They hate themselves. You are a reflection of who they wish to be. 
You notice a lot of haters online. Nameless, faceless, fake name, hiding behind a keyboard. The keyboard warriors, probably a 14-year-old teenager living with his mom in the basement. That's what they do. Or they read one post, they watch one video, and they think they've got you all figured out. It's as stupid as reading one paragraph from a book, and they thought I've got the book all figured out. I know what the book is about. That's okay. Not everyone deserves to know the real you. Let them criticize who they think you are. And number three, they want to be you, and that's why they hate you. Every single time they see you on social media, it's a reminder of what a failure they are, what they could have done. It's easy to find fault in what you do instead of finding fault in what they do. Easy to point out what's wrong with you than fix what's wrong in their life. That's okay. Don't worry about those who talk behind your back. They're behind you for a reason. Why I'm able to accomplish what I've accomplished at a young age instead of at the age of 50, 55, and 60. And that's learning from a mentor. Learning from someone who's been there and done that and continues to do it. Imagine if you are an athlete. You want to learn how to play basketball. Yes, you can learn from yourself. Yes, you can kind of play basketball with your friends. But if you want to be a professional, guess what? You need to get a mentor, you need to get a coach to show you exactly what drills do you need to practice on a daily basis to get better. What are some of the exercises that you have to do? And he's the coach, he's watching you, he's correcting you, right? He's shaping you, he is molding you, he's helping you to get to that next level. That's the power of a mentor. I am where I'm today. Yes, I have made a lot of mistakes, absolutely. I have learned from other people, my peers, Yes, but I'm where I am today because of my mentors. Most people, they let the ego get in the way of success. It's very easy, you notice people say, oh, I know that, I know that, I know that. Well, you don't know shit. You do not know it. How do you know when you know something? If you don't live it, you don't know it. So those three words are very, very dangerous and they destroy your potential, they destroy your success. Why? Because the minute you say, I know that, your brain shuts down. You're not listening anymore. And you're like, okay, I know that, I don't, I don't need to listen any further. You're not paying attention. So what, you know it. So what that you know it. It's not about knowing it. I could tell you this, I am not an original thinker. Let me just tell it to the whole world. I am not an original thinker. There's nothing new about what I do. Everything I learned from Napoleon Hill, other successful entrepreneurs, think and grow rich, uh, proven masters from the past, my mentors. There is absolutely nothing new about what I say and about what I do. I am a synthesizer. I take different ideas, I put it together. The only difference between me and everybody else is I don't say, I know that. What do I say? I say, I use that. I use that. That's a, those three words are much more powerful than I say, I know that. Because when I use it, I own it. It is mine. I, instead of everybody else, they're thinking of the ideas, they're learning about it, I know that, I know that, I know that. No, you know what? I ask, how can I use that? How can I use that? How can I use that? I implement. The only difference between me and everybody else, I can execute it better than most people. I use it better than most people. That's the only difference. Instead of you just watching a video, you watch 50, 100 videos, you don't use shit. I can use one video, I can read one book, I can take ideas and I can implement, execute immediately and I execute well. That's the only difference. My martial art instructor said something to me very profound a few years ago. He said, you know what? As a martial artist, Dan, what determines how good you are and how fast you will progress as a martial artist is not just how many hours you put into your training and, and what style that you practice. What determines how good you'll become is your Sifu, your instructor, and who you learn from. Now at first I didn't quite understand and later after I study with him, I train with him, my martial art instructor, I realized, wow, what a profound statement. Because think about in a martial art context, 
Imagine if you want to learn different martial arts, you want to learn Krav Maga, you want to learn Taekwondo, you want to learn Karate, you want to learn Boxing, whatever style or, or MMA, whatever style that you decide to choose, your instructor would dictate, would determine how good you are. Your coach, their skill that gets transferred to you, think about that. It's the same in your financial life. Who do you want to learn from? Realize when you learn from somebody, when you listen to their advice, you become them. You get their lifestyle. In the marketplace, a lot of the people, when they want to price their service, here's what most people do, right? Especially when they're getting started. They're going to the marketplace and they're thinking, let's see what other people are charging, right? If I'm offering, let's say, a copywriting service, well, let's, let me look at what other people charge. And they say people will charge this price and some people will charge this price. You see the range. Well, you know, maybe I'll just charge somewhere in the middle. That's how usually people price the, the service. That's not a very smart thing to do. Because right there, you are competing based on price instead of competing based on value. So what dictates your price is supply and demand. So the first thing you need to look at is with what you do, is it a blue ocean? Meaning, are you, are you unique enough in the marketplace? Are you uniquely qualified to solve this particular problem for your prospects? So, back then when I was a copywriter, I wasn't trying to be a copywriter for everybody. I was trying to be a copywriter only for speakers, trainers, and people who uh, put together events. The reason for that is because back in the day, when they do an event, there's always a very high payout. It's a high ticket offer, right? They do an event, it's, it's possible that they're selling $2,000, $3,000 ticket and they could have hundreds of people in the room and they need my marketing piece, my direct mail letters to put butts in seats to fill those seminar rooms. So they know even if they pay me $5,000, $8,000, $10,000 to create a campaign, in their mind, oh well, you know, if I sell two, three seats, it, it pays for Dan's fee. It's easy to justify. So you need to think about when you price what you do, what is the value that you're providing? And how can you compare the value you're providing with the service that you provide? So you're thinking about just, well, here's what I do. You will, you will not be able to charge a lot. A much better way to look at this is, okay, how can I package what I do? So now I'm selling a result, I'm selling an outcome, or better yet, I'm selling money at a discount. I'm selling money at a discount. What does it cost the prospect not to do business with me? That's a very good question, write it down. What does it cost the prospect not to do business with me? Then you can price accordingly. I think the number one leadership quality is vision. Be able to create that vision, to have clarity of what the vision is, and then be able to communicate and take that vision to your team consistently on an ongoing basis. I think that's the most important thing. You notice lousy leaders, you ask them about what their vision is, it's usually very fussy, right? They say, oh yeah, we, we want to grow our business or we want to grow our revenue. By how much? How? When? What does it look like, right? And how does each team member, how do they contribute to that vision? See, the team that is high performance, every single person on the team, they know how they play a part and being a part of that vision. So what I do all the time is I am selling my vision to my team all the time. Every single month when we have a big team meeting, I do that. Beginning a team meeting, here's the vision, saying the same thing again and again and again. Sometimes I would make the vision bigger. Sometimes I would pivot the steps of what we need to do. Or are we behind or are we ahead? But the vision is so critical. So what I do as a leader all the time, I'm thinking about where are we going? Where are we going? And how much clarity do I have for myself? How much clarity do I have for the company? How much clarity do I have for the team? So I think that's the number one leadership quality. Let me tell you something that no one talks about and why I believe for 99% of the people watching this video right now that multiple sources of income is a bad idea. It takes a tremendous effort to build up just one source of income. It takes a lot of time and effort just to sustain one source of income. 
When you try to do so many things, put in a comment, what are some of the things they're doing right now to bring in multiple sources of income? Maybe you're doing drop shipping. Maybe you're trying to make money from the stock market. Maybe you're doing day trading. Maybe you're doing real estate. You do so many things. A jack of all trades, a master of none. How much money, be honest, are you making from each thing? So instead of trying to make a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there, a little bit of money here, a little bit there, you never get good at anything. Now I've got a special bonus script from Dan on how to learn public speaking that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, out of all of those clips that you just watched, what was the single greatest lesson that you need to now apply to your life or your business? Let me know, put it down in the comments below. And if you're still here watching, you made it this far in a video, Believe Nation, we don't just watch videos, we do something, we take action. If that's you, if you are committing right now to taking some action after watching this video, give me a hashtag Believe down the comments as well because I want to celebrate you. The number one fear that most people have is public speaking. Now, why do so many people, why are they afraid of speaking to groups most of the time because they worry about if they're gonna sound stupid or how do they look or they are afraid because they might say something wrong. All these things, but you look at great leaders, almost all great leaders, they're all great public speakers, such as Steve Jobs, right? Such as Tony Robbins, Warren Buffett. One of the skills that changed my life is public speaking. When I joined Toastmasters years ago, because I wanted to improve my English and also reduce my accent, and I was improving myself through public speaking. I developed confidence, self-confidence through public speaking. So ask yourself, are you afraid to speak to groups? Do you know how to present your ideas to groups? Can you communicate with conviction and certainty? Can you interact with your audience? Maybe you get sweaty palms. Maybe you were like me in the beginning, like your face would, would turn pale, right? Your knees would be locked. That's okay, it is a learnable skill. But in order to be rich, public speaking is one of the most valuable skills that you must master. Hi, this is Dan Locke. If you're a fan of Evan's work, if you want to know exactly how to model my success, I want to invite you to join me for a special online training. All you have to do is click on the link below. You can join me for absolutely no charge. So click on the link below and I will see you in class. If you want to see the ultimate Les Brown motivation compilation, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. You've experienced a lot of disappointment. Maybe you've already given up. And maybe you just need a little fire, a little encouragement to get back in the game again.